Oh, please, Mr. Crew. Dingfelder, Goods, Here. Maniscalco, Here. Citro, Here. Miranda, Here. Carlson, Here. and Vieira. Here. Okay, we begin with a commendation, and then we're going to have, after the commendation, uh, Mr. Fernandez come for uh, the matter that we addressed this uh, afternoon, City Council. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you much, Mr. Chair and Council. Some of you may know of this prestigious place that has been here for 70 years and is a local uh, bar called The Hub. I personally have known Scooter, who is one of the owners for well over 40 years, and I'm sorry, sorry your profits went down after I stopped drinking, but the, the Hub has been there for 70 years. And these gentlemen who are the new owners, plus a third who is unable to make it tonight, have kept this tradition alive. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in the audience, at least one time of year, Gasparilla, has gone into the hub and enjoyed the libations. Uh, this place is an institution, and it has served the community very, very well. Scooter, uh, I'm glad that you carried on the tradition along with your business associates. Um, I'd like to just take two seconds and, and, and read this commendation that we are presenting to you today. In recognition of the Hub's 70th anniversary, Tampa City Clad Council gladly joins the community and the patrons in saying cheers to 70 years. We thank you for being the corner bar that has given many memories to a few generations of Tampa residents. Musical acts, drinks, and a place to unwind. The Hub has been a mainstay to the downtown Tampa scene, and for this, we commend you. We thank you, Mr. Melton, Mr. Fox, Mr. Vigil, and to the staff for keeping this gem open so that new generations can enjoy the mystique of this favorite corner bar. The City of Tampa celebrates, City of Tampa Council celebrates the milestone in with, with you and wishes you another 70 years. I don't know if you can hang out for 70 years. <laughs> of an amazing success presented on this day, the fifth day of September, 2019. We've got, we got pictures here. Anybody got a camera? Please and thank you. I thought my legislative aide was going to be here, especially for this august occasion. Here, you guys hold that. I'll stand in the scene. Yeah. You want to say anything? Thank you for uh, this award. Um, I've been here for 30 years, and uh, I've owned it for 12 years now, and I very much appreciate this. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Any uh, comments from council or Mr. Citro? Anything further? Council and, and public. You, 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 you know that you are friends with the owner when the owner can kick you out of their establishment with a smile on their face. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Scooter. Well done, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and thank you very much, Councilman. Uh, we had an item that was moved to 6 o'clock uh, this evening with Mr. Fernandez. If uh, you wish to come forward, sir. Good evening, Council Members. Dennis Fernandez, Architectural Review and Historic Preservation Manager, here to uh, respond to your motion to provide a list of the uh, currently undesignated, unprotected cigar factory buildings. And, and before you go, Mr. Fernandez, I, who, who made this motion? Councilman Dingfelder. Does anyone know where Councilman Dingfelder is? Just 45 seconds, if you don't mind, as a courtesy. All the way down. He's the only John. one left. Oh, John. John. How late? <coughs> well, 
he requested it. I mean, we let's let's move forward. Go ahead. Very good. I think they're trying to get the projector on or the overhead. Can you see that on your monitor? No. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and begin without. Uh, within the uh, city of Tampa, there remains 23 uh, factory buildings which were once used in the manufacture and distribution of cigars. These buildings uh, are uh, commonly of a vernacular that I believe uh, everyone identifies a rectangular shaped building oriented with a, a east west orientation. Um, there are other types of buildings that were used in cigar manufacturing that still exist in the city throughout Ybor City, throughout West Tampa. A number of buildings are originally up to 200 factories that were operating at the uh, peak of the cigar industry. Um, currently, uh, there are 11 cigar factory buildings that are protected by preservation ordinance. 11 of those, um, uh, or nine of those rather, are protected through their location within the Ybor City Historic District, and uh, two of them are designated as local landmark structures. I had photographs of those to show you today, but I'm, I'll go ahead and, and uh, pass that. Um, within the uh, Ybor City National Landmark District, there is one factory that is within the National District, but not the local district. Uh, that is the Perfecto Garcia factory on uh, 16th Street. And then within the West Tampa district, there are additional nine factories, or eight factories, excuse me, that are uh, within the National Register District, but not locally protected. There are two factories in the Palmetto Beach National Register District that do not have local designation as well. Those are um, uh, the La Carina factory and the Salvador Rodriguez factory. Uh, both of those are located on uh, 22nd Street, and one is a... Uh, factory that's constructed of lumber. So it's uh, one of two uh, remaining factories that are constructed of lumber. The second is located in the Ybor City Historic, Historic District. And then in the city of Gary, there is one factory on 36th Street, the Tierra del Lago, which was constructed in 1908. The remainder of the factories, as I mentioned, are either situated within the local Historic District of Ybor City and thereby have protection, or they're designated as local landmark structures. <laughs> So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the uh, processes that are in place uh, to review uh, buildings, both designated and undesignated. Okay, any questions from council? Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Um, are, did you, sorry, you, you mentioned a lot of designations. Are any of them, uh, uh, do, do any of them have the National Historic designation? Yeah. Landmark? Uh, there are, I would say with the exception of two factories, they all have a some type of national register of historic places designation. And I think the purpose in setting this up, and I don't want to speak for Councilman Dingfelder, but um, one of the, uh, we, we heard concerns from the community that one of the uh, factories was being painted and um, that that might hurt its, um, its historic um, designation or it might hurt uh, preserving it in the future. It is, um, is there anything else that we should be doing, any kind of ordinance that we should pass to try to protect these or some of the other historic landmarks? Well, uh, particularly as it applies to really any, any building within the city of Tampa that's 50 years or older that could potentially uh, qualify as a landmark under the, uh, the uh, preservation ordinances. Um, buildings that lack uh, local historic designation, um, whether they have national register designation or not, are vulnerable to uh, not only demolition, but uh, inappropriate modifications such as painting, stuccoing, um, or, or otherwise that uh, diminish their historic value. Um, and eventually they could uh, um, result in them not being considered eligible for historic designation. Are, are there any other rules or designations that you, um, or ordinances you think we should pass or propose that would help protect them? Within the cigar factories that are undesignated, the only way to truly protect those structures uh, is to apply architectural review to that, and that is afforded through uh, 
27256, which is the Historic Preservation Commission's process to locally designate structures. That's the City of Tampa Preservation Ordinances. When uh, there are when there are uh, considered to be eligible for designation, the Historic Preservation Commission will make a recommendation to Council to pass local designation on those properties. And once that designation is applied, then any exterior modifications to those properties require review through either the Architecture Review Commission or the Barrio Latino Commission, depending on when where they're situated at. Councilman. I have two questions. One, what are the qualifications for historic? What's the criteria? Uh, well, we model the criteria that is uh, actually utilized at the national level. Um, there's four criterion. Uh, the first deals with the value of the architecture. The second is if there is an individual that was associated with a particular site that makes that uh, have a historic or cultural value. Uh, if it has archaeological value is another criterion. And then this, the fourth criterion is if it is a, uh, uh, essentially a structure or a site object that contributes to the history of a particular area. So that would be uh, an area, an element with the cigar factories that would also apply in their role in the economic development of the city and the cultural heritage that you know, resulted from that. Thank you. Second question. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. I heard that there was rumor that uh, the painting of one cigar factory, it was cheaper for them to do that as opposed to repointing the brick. Are there grants out there by the city of Tampa that could be offered for, say, a 50-50 in, in repointing uh, uh, a brick building or doing some sort of maintenance, repairs, and upkeep of historic buildings that are deemed historic one way or the other? There are grants. There's different funding mechanisms that, you know, various levels of government. There's national grants, there's through the State Historic Preservation Office, there's a grant uh, program there. Locally uh, and within the West Tampa area where the factory that you mentioned is situated, we have a low interest loan program and the uh, Hillsborough County has a uh, challenge grant which assists with a matching grant up, up to, I believe, $250,000. How do property owners go about finding out about these grants? Do we have those on our website? Well, on avenues of how to get those grants? Right. All, all the incentive programs are available on the preservation website at tampagov.net backslash historic preservation. Uh, our offices are there to provide the assistance to navigate the various grants, and we can be reached at 274 3100, option three. Fantastic. Thank you. Councilman Goods. My colleague is not here, and he really wanted to talk about this issue, but I'm just going to ask if you'll provide all the council members a copy of the addresses and locations of all those uh, historical sites with the criteria so we all have it and my colleague uh, has it as well. Sure. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next we move to our public hearing. Um, I have a second. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Escaco, a second by Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And, and Councilman Carlson, you had asked about speaking. I'm gonna, I didn't know there was a presentation, but you'll go first after the presentation. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman, members of City Council, Brad Bear, Public Works Administrator. Um, I would like to uh, bring up uh, Jan McLean first before I start the presentation so she can explain the package that was substituted last night and then also um, talk about um, what would need to be substituted in terms of exhibits um, for the the new or, or improved customer assistance program that was in uh, the mayor's uh, memo earlier. Thank you. And I would ask that council members please hold all questions and comments until after the presentation is done, just so we can move beyond it. Go ahead. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and council members. Jan McLean with the Office of City Attorney. Um, and as Brad indicated, I just wanted to clarify so that you knew what you were working from uh, this evening. I sent out an email um, late yesterday afternoon with um, a substitution of the resolution and the exhibits in support of the resolutions, one for water, one for wastewater. Those are the revised exhibits to reflect the um, vote that you all took on August 29th directing staff to remove the 300 million from the rates. And so those are the revised exhibits. 
And as Brad also indicated, there's been work done um, as late as today to revise the customer assistance program. And I have a new exhibit that will be attached to both the water and, and the wastewater uh, reso that I will offer after you get the explanation of the differences. But that's what you have in front of you today in, in substitution that I sent out to you last night. Thank you. All right, with that, um, we'll get going with the presentation. Is the presentation shown to the public at this time? Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, before I get into it, the, the picture on the right is a water main break on Davis Island we were dealing with last night starting at about 6 o'clock. Um, and uh, uh, ironically, um, a picture that uh, you'll see later of the uh, Davis Island, did I say Harbor Island? Davis Island force main uh, is along this same line that we uh, just finished putting in. Um, as you know, we have held uh, community meetings in each uh, city council district, several public, other public meetings, plus presentations at city council meetings in January and in June of this year on water and wastewater infrastructure needs. Tampa is uh, simply no different than other utilities throughout uh, the United States. Um, we, you know, uh, we are just like older cities uh, that have infrastructure issues. Their infrastructure is failing, it's aging. Um, and in fact, several public works associations that grade infrastructure across the country gave our industry a D and a D minus, um, which um, is not very good if you're trying to graduate from school. <clears throat> Sorry about that. The agenda for tonight, um, first we'll, we'll show a short video on the realities of failing infrastructure, go into the water master plans, uh, the wastewater master plans, uh, the proposed funding scenario for those um, four master plans actually, and um, cover the um, new customer assistance program that uh, we're proposing tonight, and then um, one change on the schedule. Uh, at the at the very last slide and um, I would add that um, we have uh, Vanessa McCleary here to um, after I go through the basics of the program um, she would uh, like to uh, say a few things about how the program works now and uh, answer any questions you have on that <clears throat> You've seen it on the news time and time again. Large water main break. Part of North 20th Street in Tampa is shut down. A several water main breaks have happened over the weekend. There are more than a dozen breaks across Tampa. On any given day in the city of Tampa, we face multiple water main breaks. Since July 2017, there have been nearly 2,500 water main breaks, and that number continues to grow daily. In 2018 alone, there were 1,201 water main breaks. In addition, there have been nearly 1,000 wastewater cave-ins since July 2017. Water main breaks and wastewater cave-ins occur due to aging pipes. Some of the city's pipelines are reaching 100 years old. Each break can disrupt your daily life with traffic delays due to road closures, health and safety issues, and even property damage. Every year, the city of Tampa spends over $20 million repairing broken pipes. As these burdens and costs continue to grow, the plan for replacement and rehabilitation becomes a necessity. That's why the city of Tampa is planning ahead for our future. With pipes, we are investing in Tampa's tomorrow by taking a proactive approach to renew our infrastructure, prevent breakdowns, and provide long-term permanent fixes to our water and wastewater systems. Our 20-year plan will replace aging water pipes and rehabilitate failing sewer pipes in phases throughout each district and ensure sustainability for generations to come. City of Tampa customers have enjoyed very low utility rates for many years, approximately half of the average bill in the Tampa Bay area. However, 
Lower rates mean that we have not been able to take a more sustainable and proactive approach to properly invest in our water and wastewater system. The longer we wait to remedy our aging pipelines, the more expensive it will become. We expect to spend $3.2 billion over the next 20 years of this critical project that will benefit everyone. Pipes. Investing in Tampa's tomorrow. To learn more, visit tampagov.net slash pipes. So you get the idea. We uh, have water main breaks everywhere. Like I said, we were dealing with one last night. Um, these, <clears throat> so I want to, uh, that was a lot on water main breaks, a little bit on, on wastewater uh, cave-ins. So I want to go through a couple pictures or a few pictures to cover the wastewater side of the equation. You know, wastewater failures often do not get as much press but they, they result in serious health and safety issues. We, um, the first picture there on the left is a garden variety cave-in uh, that's uh, soon, or, or you know, cave-in, that's a depression becoming a cave-in. And then uh, the one on the right actually happened uh, a few years back on Sly Avenue, and, and as you can see, that's that big enough to uh, swallow a car. <clears throat> And then uh, we have force mains. Force mains are pipelines that are uh, not gravity lines, as the one you, ones you just saw. Um, they're under pressure. They're under a, a lower pressure than a water line, but when they break, we can't bypass them, at least really quickly. And so they continue to flow, continue to cause those uh, health problems and safety issues. And, uh, you know, the one on the left is on Adamo Drive. You can see uh, right there at the top of the pipe, you can see my cursor, um, it, it has corroded. And then uh, the, the one on the, on the right is uh, up at 131st Avenue. Um, and actually, this is outside the city limits. And you, you can see that this 48-inch pipe uh, imploded and uh, caused the river of sewage down that, uh, down that roadway, which had to be closed for about a week and a half. And then the, and then the third part of the equation is uh, wastewater overflows. Uh, this one on the left happened on Aileen Street uh, just two weeks ago during the heavy rains. And um, uh, you can see both of these overflows uh, end up going into our storm system and directly into the bay and into the river. So what are the costs of doing nothing? You know, the, the video touched on this, uh, that we're spending over $20 million in reactive costs and they're growing up. In FY18, we spent over $12 million reacting <coughs> to wastewater cave-ins. Um, and then um, on that same year, we spent over 10 million reacting to water uh, main breaks. So in combination, we're, we're over 20 million a year on reactive costs, and uh, those costs are going up. Now this slide, the blue shows available capital uh, available uh, funds for capital projects at existing rates. And um, the orange shows the total $2.9 billion master uh, plan cost without the $300 million in for a new alternative water supply source, um, <clears throat> uh, including TAP, including TAP, as uh, the mayor put in the memorandum. Then, as you can see, the last hurrah is this year. We um, are able to uh, use reserves and revenues um, to take care of capital improvements uh, this year. But after that, we quickly run out of money and uh, essentially uh, run out of money by 2025. And uh, at that point, we... Uh, 
get dangerously low, you have to start dipping into reserves, continue to fall further behind, and I would say this is simply not sustainable. All right, get into the uh, master plans. So first, uh, we have two primary master plans uh, for wastewater, one for the David L. Tippin Water Treatment Facility and pumping stations, and one for the pipelines um, out uh, you know, in the streets, and, or I should say under the streets. So uh, I wanna remind you here that uh, on the right-hand side shows the service area of the water department. As you can see, um, a significant portion of our customers live outside the city limits. Um, for the water customers, it's 24%. You know, I wanted to uh, you know, make people understand that because that's not too readily known by, by our customers and our citizens. This slide really, really tells the story. Uh, after World War II, we um, really started putting in a lot of pipe. You know, in the 1940s, about 100 miles, 270 miles in the 1950s. Well, those 1940s pipes are, are 80 years old. And that's not counting uh, between 1900 and uh, 1930, where we have about 50 miles of pipe that um, are approaching or um, slightly exceeding 100 years old. So we have our work cut out. Uh, the, uh, what, what happens is we've now hit this, this hump of, of more and more pipe being put in that's reaching the edge, the end of its useful life. And um, the last 10 years, the other thing this graph says is the last 10 years we've been replacing very little uh, water pipe. And, um, and I did I did total up some numbers on the um, on uh, the the miles of pipe up to 1960, and it totals up to 420 miles of pipe that we need to uh, start down the road of replacing. Okay, water main breaks they're on the rise. I tried to make this slide a little more clear than what we had at the uh, community meetings, as you can see. But um, the frequency is increasing. It's uh, uh, tripled, we're almost tripled since uh, from uh, going from October 15 up to September 19, 18, excuse me. And uh, in addition to the number of main breaks tripling, the size and cost of the main breaks are tripling. And then on top of that, you see spikes about once a year. This, this, this January 17, this is January 16, we had 113, and then we really had uh, a bad January in, in 2018. And what happens is that's uh, our coldest month of the year. And um, as it turns out, our water has a large range of temperature throughout the year. It bottoms out at 49 degrees, tops out at 91 degrees. And when you, when you have the, the cold water, it tends to contract those pipelines and pull apart the joints. And then of course it expands, you know, when the, when the water heats up in the spring and the summertime. Well, <clears throat> that might not seem, you know, like, like a big deal, but if it happens every year for over a hundred years, um, that, that wears on the pipe. It, it stresses the pipe to the point where it finally breaks. And um, as you can see, uh, a lot, an, a disproportionate share um, do happen in that January, February time frame. And, um, you know, I, sh uh, yeah, I think that's all I have on that slide. So let's move over to the wastewater side, uh, where they also had two master plans, one for the treatment plant and pumping stations, and one for our uh, pipeline system and their service area also goes outside the city limits into unincorporated Hillsborough County. Uh, they're uh, uh, people that are not uh, city citizens or city customers, 
uh, amounts to a little less than the, than the water side. It's 20% um, instead of 24. So we have one treatment plant, um, <coughs> excuse me, located down on Hooker Point that has a capacity of 96 million gallons a day, which is a big deal because, you know, other utilities across the state are at capacity or nearing capacity at their treatment plant. Our uh, plant on average discharges about 60 million gallons a day, 55 to 60, depending on the year. And um, so when we have these rains, this treatment plant can handle a hydraulic capacity of 221 million gallons a day. Um, so that gives us a big advantage. Our forefathers uh, and four engineers, I should say, uh, planned ahead for us well there. <coughs> so, um, and then, uh, you know, on the pipeline side, it's, uh, you know, very similar to the, to the water department. So the master plan for the treatment plant is a total of um, well over a half a billion dollars. And I would point out that just in the next five years, $254 million. And that, um, just to put things into perspective, that is just a slightly more than the $251 million that we have in our stormwater improvement plan. So, you know, it, that's the entire stormwater improvement plan. So that's, um, that's pretty impressive. It just kind of gives you the order of magnitude of, of what we're talking about here. On the gravity pipeline, uh, we um, are going up similar to water main breaks. We have 60% um, of our system that's greater than 50 years old. And we have one-fifth of our system that's uh, greater than 70 years old. So, you know, one-fifth of the wastewater system um, is older um, than the hub, as I just heard. <clears throat> okay, gravity uh, pipeline master plan, we split it up into priority one and priority two projects. Uh, priority one projects are shown in red on the, on the right-hand side. Priority two shown in yellow. Um, total uh, over 700 miles of pipeline. And uh, uh, I wanted to show these pictures. This is an inside of a vitrified clay pipeline that is in good shape. So uh, this is a pipeline that, that did not make the list of priority one and two pipelines. And it, it was put in a little later than, than the uh, time periods I showed you earlier. This is a failed pipeline, the bottom picture. And um, that pipeline at the, street, at the street surface, you'll see a depression to start with, and then that'll become a cave-in, and then you have a catastrophic failure to the point where you have to get in and make a point repair. The other point I want to make here is that these pipelines are uh, restored using an inversion liner technique where you put in uh, an epoxy resin liner um, and saw through the manholes from manhole to manhole and you do not have to tear up the streets to do this. So um, we, we used to replace these pipelines in place. The inversion liner method is uh, roughly half of what it costs to replace them in place. We televise all of our gravity pipelines once every seven years. We have a fleet of, of TV trucks that do that. They do a very good job of documenting every single segment of pipe and rating it on uh, condition and on consequences of failure and some other criteria as well to determine which pipelines do we line first, you know, second, and down to the hundreds? So as you can see over the next uh, 20 years, we also have over a half billion dollars in need in this area. Then we have wastewater pumping stations, small, medium, and large uh, pumping stations. And um, we have about 225 pumping stations. So uh, they have a 20-year life on their equipment. 
So roughly we should be re rehabilitating 11 pumping stations a year and uh, we're nowhere near re rehabilitating 11 a, a year. Um, but uh, you know, the uh, relative to the pipeline and the treatment plant work, you can see it, it's uh, less costly. Um, we uh, have, this is the Crow Street pumping station in the upper, upper right that we just finished rehabilitating for about $7 million. And uh, we were able to get this one in time, put in new pumps, put in new control panels up here, and uh, you know, put it back online. This one is uh, be located between the Riverwalk and uh, the Convention Center, and it's an old Spanish building that was uh, built in 1950. The one on the left, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to on time. It, uh, it failed. Uh, we had two pumps fail here and uh, had a wastewater overflow uh, that went into the river. Wastewater force mains. We, th these are, sorry about that. These are the things that kill utilities across the, uh, across the United States. Um, they, they um, are difficult to repair. You know, I, I said it earlier, uh, you can't bypass them. So the picture uh, up top here is actually not that old of a pipeline, but uh, it uh, was corroded by hydrogen sulfide gas. Hydrogen sulfide gas combines with water. It makes sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid eats these old pipelines up. So now, we replace pipeline, we replace force mains with plastic pipe. And that's what you see here on a Davis Island force main uh, that uh, failed. And we had a leak uh, right next to the channel that we had to try to dig down and fix. Uh, it was extremely difficult. And so we had to replace the Davis Island pipeline under emergency order. And you know, once again, reactive costs are double if you can plan it. And in this case, that broken water line last night, we could have replaced this forest main at the same time as that older water line on that same street and saved a considerable amount of money. So our needs are closing in on $100 million for forest main replacements um, over the next 20 years. I will say the good news for forest main replacements is you're really just talking about the last 150 to 200 feet for the most part. Uh, of that force made because that's when it becomes gravity and discharges into the system. So coordinating with the, the major capital improvement programs uh, that, that we have. And that includes all for transportation that we'll hopefully get, uh, water, wastewater, stormwater, and the streetcar expansion. And, uh, and we've been asked this question a lot. So um, we started addressing this over a half a year ago with the chief engineers and the directors in these departments of how do we make this happen? This is a lot of work. In total with all these programs, it's about $4.4 billion. Um, now it's, I guess it's about $4.1 billion with the $300 million subtracted. Um, so we um, are next going to start meeting, and actually we had our first one already, with the contract administration department is how do we package, how do we package and get this done so we don't tear up streets twice, you know, that we coordinate, we have a good public outreach program so that everybody knows what's going on, what utilities are being put in first, second, third, and um, constant contact and updates on, on those uh, programs. <clears throat> And we think we have a pretty good plan to, we think we have a really good plan to do that. So we took um, an area for each district. This one just happens to be District 5 and uh, put up the overlay of the different utilities on here. And as you can see uh, in District 5 on this one, and, and it'll, it'll move through uh, again, uh, the first thing we'll do is, is line the wastewater pipelines. We want to get in and get out of there and line those pipelines. So that's what comes up first. The green ones are wastewater pipelines. 
the blue ones, dark blue are the large, so the uh, baby blue ones there are the smaller pipelines. Then the orange is the stormwater improvements that we need to still make. And then finally, the all for transportation improvements. And, and that includes, that's not just paving. So that, that includes um, curb and gutter, sidewalks, paving, street lights, where there's going to be complete streets. All of that will be coordinated with water, wastewater, and stormwater. So it's, as you, we have a big task ahead of us to make sure that we're not tearing up sidewalks and streets twice, um, but we will, we will get this done. So in parallel with the four master plans, we conducted a rate study over the last couple of years, and it included these three components. Con con uh, con included, excuse me, looking at the consumption rate, adding a base charge for one of the only utilities in the state of Florida that does not have one, at least of any size, and certainly in the Bay Area, we're the only one without a base, co base charge. And it also included looking at miscellaneous fees and charges. Now, in, in the overall scheme of things, the miscellaneous fees and charges are, um, you know, very minor compared to uh, the revenue associated with the top two. So the decision was made, um, since some will, will go down eventually, some will go up, uh, the decision was made to uh, not include that in, in this program, in this $2.9 billion, uh, billion dollar program um, at this point. I want to point out our, our last water and wastewater rate increase was in 2011. So it was eight plus years ago. And, um, and also the other thing I wanted to point out is uh, the base charge. 80 to 85 percent of our costs in these two departments are fixed regardless of the amount of water um, we deliver, regardless of the amount of wastewater re we receive, um, our, our costs are fixed. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I know in my one-on-one -on -one briefings, uh, I used the story of the 2009 um, uh, drought. And, uh, but I didn't get to do that at the community meeting, so I'd like to do it here, if you'll indulge me. In uh, 2009, we had the tail end of a, a three-year drought that started in 2006. It ended uh, mid-May of 2009, uh, thank goodness, because we were running out of water quickly. And in that uh, year, for, for April and May, we were spending buying water from Tampa Bay Water at the tune of $66,000 a day. And um, uh, for, we were uh, also during that time, um, Council Member Miranda may remember this, we went to hand watering only, um, the most onerous restrictions in the entire state. And the good thing about hand watering only is it worked. From one day to the next, we saved 25 million ga gallons a day of water because one reason, one reason alone, people know how to turn off their irrigation systems but they don't necessarily know how to adjust them. And um, so the, uh, um, what I wanted to say there to wrap that up is the good side of that coin is it worked, but between um, the recession we were going in then uh, around that time and between the watering restrictions that we put in place, we lost about $25 million in revenue that year. Um, so that's what a base charge helps to solve. The operating expenses in this graph are shown in green. The purple shows our existing debt service payments and internal uh, loans. And then the purple is just a transfer of the $2.9 billion um, pipes uh, proposal that we've added on top of that. And again, you, you can see we, we run out of money by 2025, and uh, which is going to result uh, in reserves being depleted, bond ratings under attack and downgraded, and our infrastructure will be five years older. 
and, and not, not getting any less expensive to repair on a reactive basis. So <clears throat> our recommended funding scenario, and um, you all have seen this, except uh, you saw it with a different number at the bottom. So we, our proposal is to implement a base charge uh, like other utilities do uh, throughout the country start out at a 4% per month per equivalent resident residential unit which is essentially a single family home at two dollars each for for water and wastewater for a total base charge of four dollars per month for that entire year so in other words it doesn't go up every month four dollars it's just four dollars a month for that 12 months for that first year and then um, from fiscal year 21 through 24, we, should, we increase $2 per month per ERU, $1 for each uh, department. And that goes through FY34. And so that will um, total out in FY34 of a total base charge per month of $32 um, per ERU per month. And then in addition, we um, would we implement a consumption increase where we start out very modest in the first two years uh, for both water and wastewater um, of 3% annual increase. And in tw FY20 and FY21, and then um, instead of the 15%, as you remember before, with the reduction uh, in the program, that was changed to 11% annual increase for those next four years, and then a 6% annual increase for FY26. And that is because if you look at that orange graph, we have um, needs that are well beyond their useful life. So those, those five years of catch up, if you will, it's front end loaded. Um, we, we have things failing at a rate, an alarming rate that we need to take care of quickly and then and then ramp that down and, and um, uh, spend more consistently over the next 15 years. And then in addition, it's 1% annual increase through fiscal year uh, 2040. Then wastewater uh, a, a little more flat uh, with a 3% annual increase FY20 through 31, 4% annual increase through uh, fiscal year 40 and then um, you know as I've said before in in the public meetings paying for the capital program uh, we would roughly pay 50-50 uh, or in this case 53 percent pay go 47 percent bonding and this gives us a lot of flexibility and the flexibility it gives us the more successful we are to get outside money the more we can do with pay go and um, so that, that really helps. Okay, this is a slide to compare an average customer with the 300 million for the alternative water supply project shown in green on top. And um, the, without the 300 million shown in blue in the bottom, and it starts out where um, this, this would not kick in until year three because that 300 million cash flow didn't start on the construction until year three. And um, that increase for that first year, that gap is 78 cents. So fairly modest and it, it increases gradually all the way to uh, 2040, and then the, the difference or the delta there is $3.31 in 2040. So, um, it, but it's monthly, and uh, you multiply it by 12, and, and it can certainly help. And one last thing before I leave this slide is a reminder that uh, uh, our peer group average right now is $80.30, ours is down at $41.29. And I've got a little more detail a couple slides from now. This slide was added since the 
uh, community meetings uh, based on some feedback uh, that we received at two of the meetings. And it's a representation of a, a medium high user at the top, shown in green, the average user that we have been showing uh, at every meeting, and then uh, a lower user that um, has one or two persons in the household and does not irrigate, you know, does not have a, an outdoor irrigation system at uh, 200 cubic feet per month. The average, again, is 800 cubic feet per month, average customer. And then the customer at the top is, is I, I say medium high to user. You know, maybe this is a family of four that uh, irrigates. Uh, they have an irrigation system that they may average throughout the year using once, once a week. I just wanted to kind of give that comparison. And, <clears throat> Because these, these are typical customers, all three categories. This is a slide I was referring to earlier. Our existing uh, rate or for an average customer is $49.29. The first year um, would go up to $46.50 or, or roughly uh, $5, or not roughly, $5.21. And then, um, as compared to our peers, and you might, I don't know if you can read that on your screen, uh, but we have added the Tampa Bay water utilities that, that match our size. And we've also added um, places like Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Orlando to compare similar size utilities throughout the state. And we did it also for the Tampa Bay area. And interestingly, in the Tampa Bay area, area alone, using the small utilities, and interestingly enough, the answer was almost exactly the same to the penny. Uh, they both average about $80.30 uh, a month for the same charges. So again, roughly half. All right, we get into Vanessa's area back here, the Customer Assistance Program. And um, who qualifies? Well, a big change in, in this slide from what you saw before. This is uh, a low income, less than 30% of the average median, median income. And instead of 30% plus uh, elderly or 30% plus disabled. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, the numbers change dramatically. It, uh, the other four qualifications, it has to be a residential single family, uh, individually metered multifamily. This, this too is a departure from the stormwater hardship program in that if you qualify for all these, these uh, five uh, bullets here, a renter can qualify for this program. A renter can qualify. Now that excludes Section 80, and uh, Vanessa will be, if you have questions on that, she can answer some questions on that. Um, uh, Section 80 housing, excuse me. And then the customer must live at the address and be the primary utility account holder. Okay, so so this is the this is the big news. The old program, as I said, 30% plus elderly, 30% plus disabled. This is the number of households, the maximum number of households that could qualify for this program the way we were proposing it um, in the last couple months. The new proposal by the mayor um, is 30% AMI only. The number of potentially qualified households quadruples. This is huge. I don't know of any other utility that has a customer assistance program to this level. I mean, this is unbelievable. I haven't had a chance to check, um, but I'm comfortable in saying that um, this program is, is very aggressive and will help our people in the low income area. <clears throat> and finally, um, the benefits of the program all base charges will be waived, and um, and that would continue every year. Uh, you'll have a free personalized water conservation audit. 
So the lady you see on the right, uh, her name is Julia, and she was in, in the back, as you know, uh, giving away free water saving kits at those meetings. And she will actually go to your home and give you tips on how to save water. And I tell you what, if you conserve water, that's money in your pocket. And, you know, that means, because what, you, what you're, you know, if you've had your wave, base charges waived, then you have a consumption rate left. You can control the consumption rate. You can't control the base charge. And then finally, um, you can see she's delivering a uh, free water saving kit, uh, you know, to this customer as, as part of uh, the audit. And then uh, with, with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Vanessa McCleary, who is the Housing and Community Development Manager. Vanessa. Good evening, Vanessa McClary, Housing Community Development Manager, City of Tampa. Um, so we will, in Housing and Community Development, administer this program much like we do with the stormwater program. And when we are administering these programs, one of the other benefits that's not mentioned here is that we try to um, find if there are other services that um, the individual needs that we can provide. So with the stormwater program, we require, um, because it is for owner-occupied, we require them to um, be homesteaded and then we will look at if they do not have the senior benefit, we encourage them to get that because it's more of a savings than the stormwater. We will also ask them if they have repair needs and refer them to our owner-occupied rehab. With this program, um, the population will be much larger, so we will be working with both homeowners and renters and within housing and community development, we are aware of programs that can assist. So we will be providing that additional assistance. Um, we will take them through the application process. We are currently in the process of getting some additional software to make the online process easier. Um, we also do applications in our office. If we run into someone who cannot come into the office, we do have staff that will go out and um, take the application in the field. Um, we also work at different satellite locations, um, so we work out of uh, D3 in East Tampa um, so that we are more conveniently located. Um, we're familiar with the Water Conservation Program. We do work with Julia a lot. Um, when we have outreach events, we try to get people to conserve because we can't increase people's income, but we do try to decrease their expenses. Um, so with that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And is this the end of the presentation? Oh, that's right. Sorry. Okay. No, okay. Oh, one more slide. <clears throat> so last slide is, is schedule, and we have one, one big change on this slide. Uh, uh, the, the, other, the first four bullets you have seen, uh, the, the fourth bullet is tonight's public hearing. The last bullet, however, we, we changed from the first billing cycle in October to the first billing cycle uh, in November um, for three reasons. Uh, one, we had, uh, when we uh, needed to make this change last week, we didn't know where the Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Dorian uh, was going. Um, and secondly, we um, obviously have to test extensively our new utility management system to make sure we get that right and the, bill, the bills go out right. And third, um, with changes to the customer assistance program, we want to you know, go through that and make sure that is right too. Um, so we made the decision to add a month to, because of those three things. And I, th I think that's the right decision. And with that, that is the last slide. And um, we'll, um, Jan, you want to close with, okay. And thank you very much. We'll be here to answer questions. Uh, our wastewater director, Eric Weiss, is here to answer the wa some wastewater questions. Uh, Chuck Weber is here, director of the water department. And then, of course, our CFO, uh, Dennis Rojero, is here as well. Thank you. Um, one last uh, procedural item, Jay McLean, Office of City Attorney. What I have in front of me and I will hand to Marty is the new exhibits that reflect the revisions to the customer assistance program. The exhibit C will be the new exhibit that will replace um, the exhibit C that I sent out to you yesterday 
for the wastewater resolution and the exhibit D, it's the exact same uh, language because it's the same customer assistance program, but um, it's exhibit D and the water resolution. So I just wanted you to make sure that you had that in hand. Um, And I will need to the packet that the chair has, assuming that yeah. the action is to I adopt these, I would need to um, substitute those. Okay. Anything further? Okay, now we'll take some questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Shelby. I'm just wondering, uh, would you wish council to accept the sub substitutions by motion at this point, or do you want to wait till before they take action? Meaning what? It means to replace the, what's in your, uh, what the clerk has now with the substitutions as provided by staff. Substitution for, for the proposal? Yes, to, for consideration. So of not counsel. adopting it? You're not adopting no. it, you're okay. accepting the substitution for consideration. May I have a motion? So moved, Chair. We have a motion by Councilman Miranda, second by Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And is that is the end of the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Councilman Carlson, you wish to go first. Go ahead, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. I just wanted to start out by thanking um, the mayor and um, chief of staff and and the, the, the staff in the city. Um, we've talked over and over again about having a collegial uh, relationship between city council and the and the mayor's office and staff. And um, last week was kind of rough, uh, for which I apologize. But um, uh, the, um, the feedback we got from the public was loud and clear that they didn't want the, uh, the TAP project and they wanted us to um, work to uh, to increase the um, number of people who are available for the, or eligible for the customer assistance program and we sent that in the form of two resolutions to you all and you all responded and and did that and uh, we've gotten lots of accolades at least I've gotten lots of accolades today from the community and I'm sure you all have as well I think it's a good sign that of uh, being able to work together and especially I'm thankful um, I've seen this presentation now four times because uh, I went to three of the public meetings. It's a much better presentation and the slides are better, clearer, and, uh, and you all crunch those numbers quickly. So thank you so much for doing all that and, and helping us to do our job to respond to the public. Thank you, sir. Anyone else before we go to public comment? Sir. Well, what's your preference? Uh, do you want a long litany of questions now or, or after it, it, It's up to council. I have no preference. I mean, to, to be honest, uh, we can... It, I tell you what, is everyone okay with doing public comment first and then engaging in questions? Okay, then. I, I have no problem then. Okay, let's go forward. Public comment. If you are here to publicly comment on this uh, public hearing, uh, please at this time stand up and uh, be so recognized and come forward. And so we know, how many people are here to speak here tonight in public comment? If you could please raise your hand. Okay. I see two. Go ahead, Ben. Hi, good, good evening. I'm Nancy Stevens. I'm re representing the Tampa Bay Sierra Club this evening. And I just wanted to also echo my, my, our thanks for, to Mayor Castor and to you, to the City Council, for um, providing Tampa and planning for Tampa's water uh, supply and for withdrawing the funds for the TAP proposal at this time. Um, we also appreciate that more income families, more low income families, will be able to get assistance with their utility bills. Um, we understand that the city can't continue to lose water from uh, leaks and breaks. So even though it's going to cut, not going to be cheap or easy, we do support the pipe project in principle, and we look forward to working with you all on, on uh, sustainable infrastructure for Tampa. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Anyone else here? I saw a hand. Uh, this gentleman here. Where it appears is this gentleman going to be the last person for public comment? We are. We are disappointed. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. All right. I'm Bukhari uh, Brown. I was actually, uh, you know, disappointed to hear about the rate increase for this, uh, for this matter, um, especially considering that uh, this has been an issue been a long time. It's been a very long time. Um, this has been going on way before you guys were even having these seats. So what was going on with the funding then to take care of this matter? When he showed that slide that had, like, uh, maybe 50, 
50 miles of uh, pipe from 1900s to 1930 that was in the red. I mean, that's something that's critical that needs to be replaced. That could be worked on right away. The other stuff can be kind of tapered off for a little time, and then you can still find different funding sources. I just feel like, I mean, you guys are notorious for shuffling funds around all the time anyway, so why isn't it down that you can't find funding somewhere else, some other alternate sources before, besides saying, oh, let's just tack it on to the citizens of the city and make them pay double what they would normally be paying? That's just not, just seemed a bit unfair to me. Secondly, um, I saw uh, them mention this new funding, the uh, customer assistance program. Uh, not everybody is an owner. And if you're an owner, why do you need assistance? You own it. You own probably more than just that property. You're renting to people that's not, that they the ones who need the assistance. So, I mean, you think you're helping somebody, you're assisting the people, but you're not, the people that you really, that really need the help with the program not getting the assistance. Because if, if I own the place, I'm most likely fit outside that median. So I'm not going to be in no low 30%. So who exactly are you targeting? Who are you actually assisting? You understand what I'm saying? So I mean, I understand you guys made efforts to go from just elderly and just disabled to a more general populace. But you really, like, we're talking about inner city here. We're not talking about where, uh, New Tampa, Bayshore, Boulevard. We're talking about the inner city, where I'm from. So. Nobody can, nobody can sit there and afford it. They ain't going to be owning it. They're going to be renting. So you're not really helping them. So you're just really hurting them. The owner not living there. So he's not the one paying the light. He's not the one paying the utilities. So I just don't think the criteria is fair for the customer assistance program. But I mean, if you stop giving these tax exemptions to these properties for these big corporations like the Hilton and all these other people, you probably have some funding to pay for these pipes. That's it. Wait, <coughs> Did I hear wrong, or did I hear that your program even goes into the individuals who are renting the house, they don't have to be homeowners? I, I that, is, that is correct. Sir, sir, what, what was your name again for the record? Bacara. Yes, sir. I, 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 what I heard, sir, was that the program will help people that are renters, not owners also. I, I heard it the other way around. No, yeah. sir. No, so, both. 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 So, both. 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 So renters and Yeah, there could be owners. renters that are also. So that's, that's the, one Yeah, I, and I appreciate what you said. Yeah, I agree that's, with that's that. that's one thing. I said. heard owners. No, I understand. Right. Okay, yeah. Thank, yeah. You Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else here for public comment? Okay, we will move to council engagement questions, concerns, statements, etc. Who would like to move first? Uh, I guess it's for Mr. McCleary. I want to be clear because I know a lot of uh, my constituents are going to be concerned about that because I know we have a high volume of renters in certain Texas and five. E explain me the program again for renters. I want to make sure I'm clear on that. Sorry. Explain the criteria for the program for renters. For Thirty percent of area median income. And they cannot be on Section 8 where Section 8 is covering and giving them a utility allowance. So is this there one's any, much any other criteria than with that besides the AMI 30%? There any other criteria, any, any other criteria at all? No. Or, no. Is there any other criteria? Set forth in that in, in, in that, uh, in that sorry that they must be the primary on the account. So the person applying for the program couldn't apply for the program and have a water bill in somebody <coughs> else's name because so the landlord couldn't apply for the tenant. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure. Um, it looks like they they got you they got you uh, batting at, at different <laughs> departments uh, now. Um, so area medi median income, you might have said it at some <laughs> point. What is our area median income today so in 2019? It is based on household size. And for 2019, and so the area median income is defined by HUD, and we get those numbers. Usually, we take the first list that they provide at the beginning of the year. They will update those numbers throughout the year, but that becomes problematic. So the first time they introduce the numbers, we take those numbers, we update our data. 
So based on that, area median income, a family of one could not make more than $14,050. A family of two could not make more than $16,910. And a family of three could not make more than $21,330. So you've already done the 30%. Yeah, it's done by HUD. You actually get no. the whole chart from HUD. I know. What I'm saying is, my first question was, what is the area median income? But you, in giving us those numbers, you already adjusted it to 30% of? No. Sorry. Okay. When you, um, HUD provides the numbers for 30%, 60%, 50%, 80%, 120 and so on. And so they give you per family. So you get all of it comes straight from HUD. We do not extrapolate, calculate anything. Okay, so the so the thirty percent column is the one you were just talking yes. saying. All right, now mm -hmm. do it again, I'm sorry. Family okay. of one as well. Family of one, fourteen thousand fifty dollars. And these are also on our website on um, tampagov.net backslash eight C D. You go to housing programs and there's a button that says income limits. Um, a family of two would be $16,910. A family of three would be $21,330. A family of four would be $25,750. A family of five would be $30,170. Okay. And so, it, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just wanted to again say that we take the first set of numbers that come out for the year. Sometimes they come out in, usually they come out January, February. Lately with the administration, they've come out later. So the numbers we got came out in April. We accept those. They recently updated the numbers in June and they were slightly lower. But we do not adjust. We only adjust one time a year. Okay. So just for argument's sake, the a family of senior citizen retired couple, mm -hmm. okay, um, two, two folks on a fixed income mm -hmm. earning $17,000 has missed the cutoff. Yes. And they are subject to these rate hikes. Yes. Without exception. Okay. Um, a family of four, a young family of four, uh, husband, wife, two, two young children, getting going, uh, earning $26,000 are subject to these rate hikes without exception. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, Let's talk about this landlord issue because the gentleman in the back, I'm sorry I missed his name, but, but he, Kari, thank you. Um, he, he was heading in a certain direction and then we all, I think, veered off. But I think what he was talking about is pass through. Um, in other words, we're not allowing landlords to apply for this, correct? Correct. But the, so the, if you have a landlord, let's say a landlord owns a quad, mm -hmm. okay? And sometimes in those situations, it might be a single meter, the landlord pays it, he's gonna pass that through to his four tenants. That's not an unusual situation, right? True. Okay. In that situation, when it, if and when that happened, that landlord, if he chose to pass it through, as opposed to being Mr. Friendly, uh, it's gonna go to those four tenants in a, in a, a hike to their rent. So currently, that, and I'm just trying to understand. So what you're saying is the landlord, the person rented the place, and it includes the utilities. Yeah, I don't think that's totally unusual. It's not. Yeah. Duplexes. You could uh, provide the assistance to the landlord, but you have no guarantee it gets passed on. We have some good landlords, and we have some Well, you're, so you're jumping landlords. to the next level of analysis okay, well my, let's start with the question first the, okay just so we clarify what the program does mm -hmm. okay. it does not cover landlords right it covers the account holder which in that in my scenario the, the landlord if he passes it on which is more than likely in my opinion 
uh, my life experience, the landlord's going to pass on everything that he that comes to him, taxes, insurance, water hikes, rate hikes, things like that, mm -hmm. going to pass it through to those tenants. And those tenants will not have any recourse, correct? In our program. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure we're clear on clear clear on, on some of these scenarios. Um, I appreciate the fact that the mayor has adjusted the program, you and the mayor and whoever else worked on this adjusted the program, but I think it's really important for council to, to hear exactly what those dollar amounts are. A family of two, a, a, might be a fixed income family of two, a starting out young couple family of two, but the minute they earn more than $16,900 a year, which to me sounds like below the poverty level, uh, then, then they're going to be subject to these rate hikes and we're not giving them relief. Again, a family of four, uh, 25,000, a family of five, 30,000. So that's, um, no, I don't have any other questions on that, but that's, uh, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did have some other questions uh, for Mr. Baird. But I'll, I'll be glad to defer Any to other council members. Oh, sure. Questions. And I'm, I'm, I'm following where Mr. Deanfield is going on this. Why HUD guidelines? Why not our own guidelines? Why HUD guidelines? Sorry, the only thing that we took from HUD was the calculation of area median income. Otherwise, those are it's not HUD guidelines. But again, you're using their guidelines. You, you, you said you took that away, so you're using their calculation. Well, right? it is the industry standard. So even the state uses the HUD numbers. Um, I think the bigger, I mean, issue, I'm, I'm, the bigger issue is whether or not it's 30%. We've selected 30% of the HUD guidelines. Right. We, we I, I mean, we, I didn't we, select, we, we, 30% was selected. We in this room, mm -hmm. uh, we could have selected 50% or 60 percent or right. whatever number we opted I mean you want to have some standard for how you're selecting the number because every year it you would need it to change because the cost of living changes and the numbers change so if you have a standard I'm not sure what other standard um, you would use that's just the one that I'm, I'm familiar with and we, it comes out every year. I know how to get it. Anybody who wants to get it can also go to the same source and get it. It's not something that we did here locally for anybody to challenge um, the calculation. Um, so that's why we're using that one. I, I just feel like, you know, again, we always have a gap. And I just look at uh, two elderly people and they get in that crush where they, they just one year they make $17,000. Now they can't get any assistance any assistance at all, but they're elderly, they're not making any other type of income, or it's not growing, so now they're in that gap. So again, they're, they're elderly, 65, 70 years old, I mean, so my thing I, is- I, I do not disagree with you, because my office is the one that when that person is slightly over, has to say no. And it's not something that we take lightly, and it's not something that's easy to do when you know that a family is struggling. I'm simply going to implement the program however it's decided. Now, if you'd like me to give you the numbers for 50%, I can give you that. Um, but this council has to make a decision on how you want that program, and I will implement however. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cross. Two, two quick questions um, related to this. <clears throat> what you all must have done some kind of modeling to anticipate what the other assistance program costs. I, if I remember correctly, were there 3,000 people eligible or 2,900, something like that? Um, but you must have had some model to figure out how much that would cost a year, and then now you've increased it to 29,000. So do you know what the additional cost is to the city in, in, in the decision to expand it? Good evening, Council. Dennis Rojero, Interim Chief Financial Officer. Yes, as presented to you, the anticipated maximum impact to the city of Tampa in the initial year is approximately $1.4 million. And if I could add just a little bit of detail on that, um, with this setup, you know, it, it, it has to be absorbed by the general fund. 
the same fund that we're often emphasizing in terms of not only um, uh, what our most flexible funding source is, but again, you'll recall the, the very recent discussion, discussion about the sensitivity we feel of those particular reserves. That's the impact, about $1.4 million, based on the scenario just presented to you. And is that, a, is that at 100% subscription of it, or is that some model that uh, as estimated usage? Or? That is presuming everybody eligible okay. that so we anticipate is eligible takes advantage of the program. And then, um, I don't know if Ms. O'Cleary, you would be the best for this, but it, it, is it possible, or do we have in other programs a, an emergency assistance program if somebody's lost their job for a temporary amount of time? Um, that we cover them for a, sh a short period of time. We, in the beginning of all this, we talked about like a universal fund. Is there something like that that we have to help people get through a gap? Uh, not through the city, but those programs are provided through the county. Okay. Anyone else? And you had further questions? Yeah, on, on this issue with Vanessa, if we want to finish it, and then I'll ask some tech, more technical and financial questions. questions. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay, Mr. Baird. Um, I think I previously had been here for a rate hike, I think. Uh, <laughs> I was probably it, presenting back then, too. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it feels very familiar. Um, but my question, I've got a couple of questions uh, as related to the rate hike. And, and let, me, let me start out by saying you all have done a really good job. I actually read through all these master plans. Uh, Chuck uh, and Eric sent them to me, thank you, uh, by email. And, um, and I've read through them. I think they're very comprehensive. Yeah. Some of them are amazingly technical, which some of them went over my head in terms of the plant operations and the choices, the choices that might be need, needed to be made in terms of options, mm -hmm. uh, certain options and that sort of thing. I don't know that those are totally nailed down yet. Uh, and I'm not really sure which direction you nailed them down. Um, but we, we can get to that in a little bit. But going back to, oh, and the other, the other issue is need. I totally agree with the need. I, I agree that we have pipes collapsing. I agree we've got preventive maintenance at both plants, in the pumping stations, et cetera. So I just want to be abundantly clear on those issues before I ask some tough questions. But you can handle it. <laughs> but in prior years, when you've asked for rate hikes, okay, how long, how long did they last, the rate hikes? So in prior years, um, and for many years, uh, water, wastewater, and storm and stormwater, solid waste alternated every three years. It, it was that was done for probably 20 years straight, for, so you, for during the Greco years, and then and then some in the early Iorio so it was years. Sort of a leapfrog thing. It was um, a leap. It was a leapfrog thing. And However, so those those increases were very modest. Um, the three three percent kind of increases, and so the first year, your revenues were um, um, higher than your needs, and you were able to um, you know do well. On that second year, it you barely you about broke even. On the third year, you weren't receiving enough revenue to make the improvements. Well, what's what's blowing my mind here is this twenty year ask. Okay, mm -hmm. this. Because I think it's unprecedented. Um, that, that was my recollection that we typically in the past, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five years of, of rate hikes. You just said it was basically three years per department. Um, right. All of a sudden, we're, we're, go, we're, looking, we're looking for a 20-year rate hike commitment, not only from, well, for initially from this council and then ultimately from, you know, from the community if, if this council votes for it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what's sort of blowing my mind. And I know we've had discussions in the past about, you know, bond, you know, bond issues and bondability and that sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and I know you want to keep this 50-50 percent pay as you go versus bonding. But I guess my core question is going to be, and, and I'd like to, if you could throw up that chart Kind of looks like this, Brad. And if okay, you want to sure. borrow, the, borrow this, you can borrow this. Um, uh, yeah. If we could, uh, in the back, bring up uh, the slideshow again. 
<clears throat> kind of looks like a glacier or something. Right? It's <laughs> See, hold up that again. That was the first one I showed, right? Yes, yeah. that one? Yeah. So I see, and I can't exactly read it, but it, but it looks like a huge chunk of money and a huge amount of stuff of great opportunity for us to do amazing things between 2020, well, we're obviously we're past 18 and 19, mm -hmm. so we're at 20, let's say look at the 2020, between 2020 and 2025, I, I can't calculate exactly how much money that is, but it represents a lot of great stuff that needs to be done that we could do within the first five years. And the other reason I picked five years, Mr. Shelby was reminding me of this the other day, not as related to this issue, but our, our typical CIP capital improvement plans, as I recall, are five-year plans. Mm -hmm. We look out five years, see what's needed, plan for it. Dennis does his number crunching for it. Everybody gets geared up for it. Council approves it. I think we're, we just approved it the other night uh, on first reading. And then we go from there on a five-year basis. So again, I don't understand the compelling reason, even though the master plans clearly tell us what we could do, you know, to me, it's a little bit like, and you and I have raised a bunch of children, you more than me, but, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of like, you know, you're, the, the, the kids, you know, what, what they want, not to say you're a kid or anything, even though you wish, but the kids <laughs> saying what they want versus what they need. And, and, I, and I would argue that a, a five-year commitment and the five year and the the accommodated the 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 associated five year rate hike, which is not insignificant, giving you the base rate that you want, um, you know, in those first X number, you know, five years, giving you the ERU increase that you're looking for for those five years, mm -hmm. not really changing anything, but sort of cutting it there, and then regrouping. Um, or even after two or three years to see how things are going and then, and then come back to, to look at an additional X number of years so we can keep leap mm -hmm. Um I, I, I haven't heard a compelling reason to, to look at 20 years, a 20 year commitment. And, what, and the other part of the 20 year commitment that concerns me, and this, if you can go to the slide that spoke to comparing us to the other neighboring governments, And y'all did a good job with the slides. Thank you. Thank you. We worked hard on that one. Well, all of them. They're all good. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, well, comparing to the other utilities. Uh, yeah, those. That was it. Okay. Yeah. The the other one is that. Well, maybe I'm not sure if this is it or not. It, did it. you have another one that showed the uh, the years? I had to yeah, compare to the 300 without yeah, the 300. Yeah, okay, I think that's it. So look at the black dot on the left, which is the $80, $80 peer group. Correct. I recognize that's in today's dollars. Right. Okay. And so everybody would be anticipated to increase oh. somewhat. We don't know exactly what. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just 3% every year or something like that. But, <laughs> but anyway, so if you go across uh, that $80 peer group, where do we where does that hit uh your proposal well interestingly enough it hits right around the five years um actually it's 2028 it's it's eight years so it's right it's uh if you okay, do which line, line are we looking straight, at we're yeah, looking at the blue line across, it, it, um we're looking at the blue line now yeah the blue line All right, 2027 crosses. and a half i'll give you that <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but it, bottom line is I'm not that far off. That's five or six years, six years, six and a half years. And that's when we, you know, get, get right into the average. Now, given they'd be up a little bit more because over the years everybody will be growing up. But if we say, if we say, okay, let's just stick with this 20-year plan 
folks, we're at $41.29 right now, <clears throat> and the 20-year plan talks about tripling, almost triple. So, so if we voted this way for 20 years, it triples or almost triples up to $114 for the average, the average family, the average bill. Okay. Okay, three things. I have good answers first for question, you. First question was, what is the compelling reason to go beyond five years okay. tonight? All right, three parts to that. First of all, the four master plans are 20-year master plans. Yes. Secondly, that um, the 20-year expenditures that, that we're proposing um, get you caught up at that 20 years. You are not caught up at 10 years or five years. As a matter of fact, you have still a lot of infrastructure that's beyond its useful life. And again, it's more expensive to be reactive. So you would have a lot more reactive. And um, so what you want to do is get caught up at the end of that 20 years, plus or minus a year or two, and, and then start being proactive more and more and more, being 80% proactive, not 80% reactive and getting ahead of that, getting ahead of that curve, getting, you know, those things replaced. Because I remind you, um, this slide, um, oh, which one am I looking for here? We started putting in a lot of pipe, yes, after World War II, but the, these lines and the miles of pipe we put in in the 60s, I'm sorry, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it's a lot of pipe. And you want to be ahead of that. It's even more pipe. And then those pipes are 80 years old. You don't want to be replacing those pipes at 100 years old because you'll still be just as reactive. So that, that's the second reason. The third reason is if I can oop, go down to the, this slide. I remind you that when we, when we get into the out years, we have, when we get past the first, um, what is this, two, um, I'm sorry, especially for on the consumption rate increases, when you get past the first four, um, not including the first two, you have four years, um, five years that are above that 3% you mentioned. After that, it's 1% through fiscal year 40. It's, it's, it's really no different than a cost escalation at that point, which, by the way, we don't have that. That's another thing that most utilities have a price escalation automatically built in. Um, so those, those are the three reasons uh, that I have for, those, for um, uh, your first question. Okay, Ben. So I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but I believe I've got a fourth <laughs> reason. Uh, of course, everything uh, Brad said was correct, but uh, reference, if you could put the slide back up, please. You'll see at the bottom there, of course, and, and Brad explained earlier, for simplification purposes, it's about half pay as you go, and it's about half bonded. A five-year increase, for instance, would severely limit how much funding we can bond, which would mean we'd have to pay more as you go. Because when you issue debt, they want a dedicated revenue source for a, for a sufficient period of time to pay that debt. And of course, the less you bond and the more pay as you go, a dollar today is going to be worth less tomorrow I, and the next day. I sort of. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, and and the costs, of course, as Brad okay. said. I kind of anticipated <laughs> that. Okay. It leads me to my another question on my page, which is, are you really going to take down that money for years six through ten and start paying interest on it in advance of using it? I wouldn't think so. No, we would time, I'm, I'm trying to simplify, and we would time the debt drawdown based on what logistically, logistically that can be done with right. the resources. You take out bonds in series. Yes, you, 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 you might do a five-year package and, and then another five-year package and another five-year package. So you're not going to get a better rate necessarily on that second 
year six through ten, just because we've approved it in advance now. What I think maybe you're missing my point. Mm -hmm. My point is, I'm not saying. And can you go back to the big, the the one that has the big home? Yeah, it's, but it's that, that's a, a that's the one that was added mm -hmm. on to O and M. But um, it's using a sophisticated term. There. Oh, okay. there you go. Uh, one oh. Yeah. Okay, I'm not saying that a council four or five years from now wouldn't continue this program because it's a well thought out program. Okay, that based upon a good comprehensive master plans, et cetera. One of the things that concerns me is there a recession. All right, you know, there's a, there's a very good reason that you didn't stand in front of the, the council four or five, six years ago, come, you know, in the middle of the recession or coming out of the recession with the program. The needs, the needs were still there. The needs have been there all along, but you, you wouldn't have done it because it, it wouldn't have been fair to the community. It wouldn't have been smart. It wouldn't have been anything, and that's why you didn't do it. And that's why that mayor didn't do it. Um, now things are okay, although there's little whispers of recession uh, that scares all of us, I think. And some, some council member mentioned it the other day. Um, but what concerns me, again, is you're looking for this 20-year commitment that has you know, typically it doesn't have an out clause necessarily, and um, an escape an escape valve. Uh, I haven't heard of, of that in this in this program. And what if there was a recession two or three years from now, and yet we've still now we've got a 20-year commitment as opposed to a five-year commitment. I'm. It's kind of ironic because I don't consider myself a overly conservative guy, but I'm but I'm looking at this from a conservative perspective. And I think that us approving this on a truncated version of five years at a time, I think is very conservative mm -hmm. and, and appropriate. Um, um, if, I, if I could address that a little bit, uh, yeah, sure. uh, Councilman Dick Beller. And I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, our, our recession, as you recall last time, was, was basically 2007 through 2010. Our last rate increases were from 2007 to 2011. So we, we kept those, and, and those were, I don't have those off the top of my head, and maybe Mike Perry does, um, but they were, they were more um, on a consumption rate increase than we're proposing uh, uh, here in those uh, final 10 years. So, um, and we did not suspend those rate increases, and if we wouldn't have had them, we would have been in more of a, you know, we would have been hurting a lot more right now. So I just wanted to point that out. We did but, go through the recession with the rate increases for five but years. But you didn't, correct me if I'm wrong, though, I don't think you came to council when the recession, you know, after President Obama came into office and everybody knew we were in deep you-know-what when all the banks were crashing and everything else, I don't think you came to council and asked for an increase after that point. It right? was two, it was 2007. And but, I, actually, but he got sworn in 2008, and that it was okay. at the end of 2007 that the that all the banks were crashing and everybody knew that there was severe problems. So not, I don't know when you came in. So 2007 for, for water, we came in for two, in 2009 for wastewater. So we did come in in that time. How big was that request? Yeah, the wastewater actually the increase was uh, bigger than water because we had to wait those two years because mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Iorio wanted to stagger that. So it was like three percent or something. Uh, Mike, you remember? We don't remember that okay. off the top of our head. All right. Anyway, again, I just think a more conservative approach. Um, looking at you know, I mean, that's a huge amount of money. How much is that five year? Thing. I was trying to add it up just now. The first year is 250 million. The second year is 300 million. The third year is 300 million plus. Well, that's, well, that's about a billion. Yeah. Just, just in those three years. Right. Right. Exactly. That's my point. Is it's not it's not chump change. What's the biggest project the city's ever undertaken? Is anybody's recollection? I do. It's 
the last That's biggest the, the last biggest was uh, at the Howard F. Kern facility when we expanded from 60 to 96 million gallons a day. Um, and that was about $120 million. But uh, the last one before that was um, in the 1970s when we, we expanded and built the advanced wastewater treatment plant uh, down on Hooker's Point, it was at a time called Hooker's Point Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant. It was about $100 million in, in 1970s numbers. It was more than what it cost to build the Tampa International Airport. It was the biggest um, infrastructure project in the city at that time and had and was thereafter for quite a few years. Right. So five, if, if this council gave you five years approval tonight, we're not being stingy. We're giving, you know, we're authorizing you to have rate hikes. And I'm not even saying change those rate hikes. I'm just saying truncate them at five years. We're giving you rate hikes that pay as Dennis said, somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars instead of the 2.9. Now, the, it doesn't say that you can't come back, like I say it, three years from now or something like that, and say, boy, we are doing great. We're managing this program great. We've proved ourselves, you know, super to the, up for the task, and now we want to go ahead and continue this program. There's nothing to, there's nothing to stop that. And, and, by the way, we're not in a recession, so this, this isn't potentially hurting hurting folks let me let me throw a few other uh, issues out there um, regardless of where we go on this tonight I'm, I have WMBE concerns on this and I've expressed them uh, where's he running anyway I have I had WMBE concerns on this they're not really concerns but what I've said to you Brad uh, on several occasions is this is this is a three billion or a one billion dollar opportunity for us to to make great strides on our, our women and minority business enterprise um, program much better than we have in the past. And yes. that's just my opinion. And because it's such a huge chunk of money, some of that, a lot of that money should stay within the community. A lot of that money should be into the African American community, in the you know, other minority uh, parts of our community. Um, and I haven't heard the first word on that in terms of how we're going to do it, what we're going to do better, you know, what our goal is. Is it a 20% goal? Is it a 25% goal? And how we're, just how we're going to improve our, ourselves in that regard. Um, okay, if I may address that. Um, in our opinion, and, and I had, I've had discussions with uh, Gregory Hart on this, um, a, a few things. The uh, design build process, I think, gives us an opportunity to really um, uh, improve on that. And um, we're working together with the departments um, to be able to do that. Um, you, you know the goals are set project by project, depending on what the opportunities are in, in those projects. So, you know, some are going to be more than others. Some you, you may be well up to 50% and some down, you know, Quite a bit lower um, so we think uh, and, and as you know those teams are selected and they're they're scored based on their percent uh, of participation to be able to uh, to be able to present um, that's one thing some of the smaller items uh, that hopefully can be uh, accomplished through the job order contracting system we can put requirements in there and uh, Gregory Spearman is talking about doing just that so that you know, in order to get the work, you 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 need to step up to the plate and have WMBE participation. So we think in those two areas, we're going to be able to see an increase in WMBE participation. So Mr. Hart has candidly told us that uh, his staff had, was cut during the recession, okay, and he's operating at something like half the staff that he was before the recession he he filled at least one of those vacancies Dennis you may know that All right. uh, staff yeah. with Gregory oh, yeah. yeah okay he, line, he got additional and he filled them the bottom line is if it's a billion dollars you're getting or three billion dollars 2.9 billion dollars you're getting are you planning on hiring specific MB WMB folks for this program I don't know the answer to that does anybody here know that 
I know we we are planning on uh, uh, hiring additional staff for Vanessa's, uh, you know, for Vanessa for obvious reasons because we changed the program and she will need staff to process that. Um, but I don't know if that division is increasing. I do know Greg well, is. I, I meant specifically out of your budget, um, out of this budget. Out of the two point nine billion. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would oh, think I would. You're adding engineers. You're adding cap project managers. And stuff like that because you and I have talked about that yeah I don't know I don't think we know the answer to that off the top of our head it sounds like it hadn't been decided I, on yet no we have like you say we have added staff I don't know if it's in that area or not but I want to add that um, Greg Hart is in every one of those consultants competitive negotiations act selection I serve as chairman and we have that long discussion after those presentations after every single one of those and he, he is confident that we can really increase that participation through this program. He's pretty excited about it. But I, I think in terms of compliance, that's, why I, that's where I think that we're, we might need additional staffing, um, not just on the front end, but on the back end, okay, to, we, make, to make we, sure that there's compliance. And the we, last one, we, um, the last thing I had was related to impact fees. Um, I've been saying all summer long that, that if some of this money is related to future needs, and I'm not sure it is anymore. It's a little bit unclear. No, it's um, not anymore. Okay, so the 300 million is out, which is the future needs. Correct. So we'll address that another day. So therefore, the impact fee issue is not on the table tonight. Correct. It is not, and um, I do believe we are coming in front of city council toward the end of September uh, for Dennis and Mike to address. Um, the results of that study, uh, yeah. th that part of the study lagged the other two components. Yeah. I just didn't want to be discussing impact fees a month after we approve something tonight, if, if right. it was relevant, but you're saying it's not necessarily relevant. It's, it, it's not because that piece was taken out, so, um, but we still need to talk about impact fees. Um, um, when, when that comes back, we need to address all, um, all not alternative, um, but new water supply in some way in the future. Okay. Is there is there any precedent for a 20-year commitment from council? Have you ever asked council for 20-year commitment on anything? I have not, that I recall. Have you ever asked council for anything more than a five-year commitment on anything? I don't recall that either. No, Thank but you. they did ask for a stadium for 30 years. You True that. So and I'm you, and you voted against it, Joe. How do you know? Because I've been around too. <laughs> I remember. I remember the whoa, black. Whoa. You mean you believe a politician? I remember. I remember the black suit. You mean you believe a? Look at this, half black now. <laughs> well, that's a good point. The C I the community investment tax was a thirty-year program. Did, Mr. Chair, if I may. Then, Brad, has there ever been a project of this magnitude? There has never been a project of this there magnitude. There has never been a project of this magnitude that's calling for this amount of funding. That's right. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Councilman Miniscalco. Uh, a couple things. You did ask for a commitment, 30 years for the stormwater assessment back in 2016. Thanks How could I forget? <laughs> Thanks for I'm still hearing about it. But, <laughs> Thank um, you, Councilman. And, and in response to what Councilman Citra just asked, has there, any, has there ever been a project of this magnitude the stormwater assessment at $251 million may have been the the record up until this point. Now, you know, it's it's closer to $3 billion. Yes, and my apologies at, for leaving that out because we're doing a very good job on that, so thank you but, for bringing um, that up. You know, I look at it like this. In comparison to uh, other cities, uh, you know, counties, whatever, throughout the region, we're the cheapest or one of the cheapest. Look at the city of Clearwater where it maxes out. Um, and a city of our size... Um, with the you know the territory we have within city limits and the needs that we have um, since I began here in 2015 I would see and hear of daily water main breaks and I would hear it from the people in my district oh this street is closed again because of the water main break one night as I was walking into the movie theater last year I think it was the Rome water main break oh you need to get down there what am I gonna do when there's water gushing into people's houses you know the city's out there fixing it and whatnot but it's a daily occurrence. You know, I go on Twitter and Facebook and all the different social media accounts with the city and it's road closure until water main break, water main break. And 
because I love history and I usually bring up something historical and because you showed the uh, chart of the age of the pipes, Mayor Curtis Sixon, back in the 40s and 50s, was known as a big public works expansion investment mayor. And you mentioned those. Those pipes are now approaching 70, 80 years old. My grandmother is 92, born in 1927, and we have pipes that are failing, clay pipes, that are older than she is. You know, but you can only repair so much. Mm -hmm. And infrastructure is so important. And I go back to 2016 and voting for the, um, the stormwater assessment because it was a need. It was an expensive need. But we were dealing with constant flooding issues at so many of the in intersections and areas that you know all about. So when it comes to this, although it's a historical, huge investment, that's the key word is investment. And uh, when we talk about five year, uh, looking at it five year or 30 year, when you bond something, you know, you need to look at the, you, know, you get a better rate at 30 years. It costs money, it costs interest and whatnot. But we need to look at the future. We need to look at taking care of these pipes and not, you know, fix as they break and spending all the, I mean, we're essentially throwing money away every year. Uh, last year we spent so much, the year before was a little bit less, but constant water main breaks, this repair necessity. So I'm happy to support this. I understand, uh, you know, TAP was taken out, which I appreciate, which I have yet to meet anyone. I think I saw someone on social media say that they would have supported it, but I couldn't get anybody to buy into it. Nobody, I couldn't convince anybody. You expanded the uh, customer assist assistance program, which is much appreciative because we have to think about our lowest income, you know, working families that, that do struggle. But we're doing the best that we can, or the administration is, is, is showing, you know, their best effort. And most importantly, you've been responsive to what council has asked from TAP to this to whatnot. And we appreciate that. So I think the mayor is uh, doing a good job, the administration, all you guys. But again, this is a, this is a, a need because I'm seeing it every day, the water main breaks, the constant repairs, the constant road closures. And, I, and I'm one to say we need to pave the roads throughout the city of Tampa. But if we're constantly tearing things up, you know, when will we ever get to that final end product of, of what people want? So that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say, but uh, that's where I stand. Thank you. Councilman Citra. One, one last thing, and, and thank you, Councilman Maniscalco. I, I look at this project as the future, not just here, not just today, the future, 20 years from today. Uh, and I agree with uh, uh, Councilman Miranda. It's time to stop repairing and start replacing so we have a great base for our future. I can support this. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Um, <clears throat> again, I appreciate you all taking uh, the tap and new sources out of this. Um, still one of the concerns, and I miss, mentioned this to Ms. McLean earlier, uh, the, the, the public that doesn't want it, which I think is everybody I've talked to, um, wants to make sure that this money that we're approving is not used for that. Is there some way that we can put that in the resolution that we're passing or, or some way we can get assurances that for whoever in the public is watching, I want to let them know that I asked the question. I want to make sure that it's not going to get spent for that. There's a lot of planning and, and feasibility studies that are done for these projects and they just want to make sure that it, that, that is not paid for with this money. Uh, Jan McLean, uh, Office of the City Attorney, and um, we did discuss this briefly um, before uh, the, count the hearing this evening, um, and I conferred with um, uh, uh, with um, I'm sorry, um, uh, Andrea uh, Zellman, um, it, to make sure that my opinion was um, accurate. These resolutions that you have before you tonight are the ones that set out the framework for the adoption of the rates. Um, it also establishes what it's going to, what with the history of us, uh, the resolutions that have come before, that what we are superseding and what we are replacing it with. You'll also see that the basis for the need for this is encompassed within your whereas clauses, which is based on what you heard from um, Brad and others um, today and previously based on the, the master water and wastewater plans as they have been set forward. So in, within those plans, and as you have directed by your vote last week, there is no inclusion for alternative water supply money, um, which equal to $300 million, which we uh, reflected in the exhibit. So I would rather um, 
and I think that it's more appropriate legally to not have some sort of uh, directory uh, statement within the whereas clauses as far as what it can and cannot be used for because it's based on the master water supply, um, excuse me, on the master water and wastewater plans, and that's what the rates will be used for. That's what your staff has indicated to you this evening. Thank you. The other, the other question that I gotten from the public was, um, uh, just to make sure, and again, you, you, we talked about this briefly. I just want to say on the record, um, um, the, um, the the decisions that are going to be made incrementally along the way with this money, they still come before city council. So we're not taking away any uh, rights of future city council because it's going to go way beyond us for 20 years. Absolutely. That's the strongest um, authority that council has. Whenever there's an expenditure of money for any of these projects, the contracts are going to come back before you, whether they're the inclusion of the issues that Mr. Dingfelder raised or what they're exactly to be used for. That is the, with the authority of the approval of council. Can I make one last, one last statement? Um, uh, I think it was um, courageous of the, of the new mayor to take on this as the, as the number one issue or the biggest issue in the beginning. She's addressed a lot of issues and made a lot of changes, uh, which I'm very happy about. But this showed political courage because this is not a vanity project, obviously, and she quotes Mayor Aureo. Um, I went to three of the four public meetings and I saw her personally vouch for it and I saw the respect that she had and the encouragement she got from the community. And I think if she's going to stand out for something that is definitely not going to help in anybody's reelection, I, I, I want to stand beside her and support her in this. It, these kinds of projects are important for our community. Um, they're not things that we're going to get accolades about, but we also can't kick the can down the road and and, uh, and not get this done. Mm -hmm. So thank you to you all for bringing this forward and um, I'll be uh, supporting it. Anyone else? I defer. Go on, go on, go on. Well, uh, I do agree with a couple of things Mr. Dean Fellow said. Uh, it is a high dollar that's coming for us. And I look at increments to make sure things are flowing correctly and the project's going. Two, when I look at other cities, like the city of Orlando, I look at their numbers of uh, minority contracts. I look at the amount of money you, you're asking. And I look at every day when I sit in this council every Thursday and we talk about contracts, Ms. Dean Phillips is talk about how come our numbers are down here and not up here for a city of our size. That concerns me. And later on down the line, we're going to have to do something about, about that. Now, those numbers and how we do contracts here. Uh, my word is my bond. I said last week, Wednesday, that I would support the project because I understand the need for pipes. I understand the need for my business because, like I said, if I had a fire in my business, we'd have some problems because the pipes are bursting. So uh, I'm going to support the program. Uh, but I, I want to make sure this council understands that when we get down the road, I'm going to be pressing hard to make sure that we're going to be getting those numbers up for minority contracts. Everyone has a bar they set, and if they don't set that bar, people don't get contracts. If we, people want jobs, want contracts, they've got to do what we want done for our city. And uh, I think I, I want to make that clear. I'm going to bring that up every time until we get it right, until we get an ordinance, until we get something put in place that we're going to have a standard. And when we spend this kind of money, I don't want to hear people call me, how come we're not getting any contracts? I do not want to hear that. That's going to be a problem for me. That's fair enough. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Councilman Goods, I just want to take a moment to work with what you just said. I'm going to be putting special oversight into that project um, that you're talking about. And, I, you know, I've talked to the mayor about that, and we need to move the bar, and we're going to work together to move it. So I just want to make sure you know you have my commitment to watch over this at the same time that council's watching over You'll have my support. Okay, uh, Councilman Moran. Thank you. Although I, 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 I understand what Mr. Dickfelder was saying in the numbers, but at the end you have a start and you have an end. And whether you do it in five-year increments or in one 20-year increment, it's still 20 years. And the problem is that we don't know if you tie into something now, and I don't know how the procurement's going to be, what you guys are going to do in, in your department, ladies and gentlemen, in your department. So if you tie it in to price, you might get a better price now than later. I wholeheartedly agree on the 5349. Anytime you bond something at 100%, at the end of the day, you only get half of something done. 
because the other half would spend an interest. Even though this has a component of interest, it's certainly much softer than bonding out $2.9 billion. The rate of return would be very dismal as far as productivity in fixing the pipes both on stormwater, I mean on wastewater and in water. So I've always supported water and wastewater. 20 years ago, I guess you and I were the only ones around. <laughs> 20 years ago, you and I were talking about a $2 on each side. It never happened for one reason or another. When we go to Clearwater in a bi-monthly meeting, we talk about that for the last four or five years. When Chuck Walters, I almost forgot his name because I call him Kansas because there's where he was born. Uh, we've talked about that. There is no good time to raise any rate. Never. Whether you're in recession or you're on top of the hill because that hill moves on a constant basis. And it's very difficult to do these things, but that's got what we got elected for. And, and I understand, I hope the program is administered like was said. I hope that we can get by the individuals who own units and maybe, I don't know if legally we can get, we can't pass a law to prohibit, maybe the legislature can say if you're getting a benefit because your tenants are of less than the minimum wage, what at minimum wage, then you can't absorb that for yourself. You have to pass it through. I can't do that. I don't believe I can. I think only the state legislature can do that. So I'm, I've supported the project and I continue to support the project. Thank you. Councilman Dingfeld. Um, Mr. Bennett. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I had a thought on, on this in terms of uh, reporting. Um, I think that, again, with a project of this magnitude, I think a, a quarterly report um, from Brad and whatever staff he wants to send, uh, updating council on every aspect of this program, no matter how long it is, five or 20 years, um, would be appropriate, including uh, including uh, the WMBE component. Um, would, you, would you, as chief of staff, have any objection to, to whoever ends up making this motion, uh, including a quarterly report, automatic quarterly report for as long as these rate hikes are in effect? I, we have no problem with accountability, Councilman. Um, I've already talked to staff, irrespective of this project, about those kind of reports. Um, the mayor's actually allowed us to work with the uh, audit department, and we're adding a position just for this type of accountability. So we're looking forward to those comparative statistics, which has taken us on some great journeys about quality assurance in the past. So we're looking forward to moving that right into the same same uh, arena. So yes, we have no problem with that level of accountability. And, and I think the quarter reports can be really exciting. You know, to, uh, Brad, can, Brad can show us what we're accomplishing. I think that's good for the community. Again, like I said this afternoon about putting up signs that say this is this is where the uh, all for transportation money is going. Right. Uh, similarly, the reports every quarter can say, okay, we have the reads rate hikes, but this is what we're accomplishing. And that's important, as you say, as related to accountability. It's yeah. important for all of us. I, you know, I, I think it's time to celebrate what's underground as well as we celebrate what's above ground. So let's do it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm still alive. <laughs> and oh yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, Jay McLean again. I just wanted to clarify before any motions are made, the um, resolutions that you have before you. You have a wastewater um, resolution for uh, disposal charges. You have a water resolution for um, ink rates with uh, one that was had been substituted as of last night and the exhibit um, C and D to them respectively that was substituted earlier um, this evening. So those are the documents on which you are. And, and before, uh, 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 Councilman Dingfeld. Um, Jan, um, in regard to timing, Brad started off the conversation by saying we're not going to implement this rate hike in October for a variety of reasons. We're going to do it November 1st. 
fine, good, you know, whatever. Um, if this board approves X tonight, but we tweak the, um, I can't remember what Vanessa called the program, the, uh, anybody remember? The customer assistance, customer assistance, assistance program. program. Thank you. But we tweak the customer assistance program. That's going to modify, I think, your resolution somewhat, isn't it? Yes, because it's an exhibit to the resolution. So the, that's why they, you made the motion and accepted the substitute exhibit um, C for the wastewater rates and D for the water rates so that you have the revised customer assistance program that was proposed by. Right. And what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting is if we, by motion in the next couple of minutes, again tweak it in a manner that's not typed up in front of us, um, that's not going to, I mean, and, and you'd have to come back with a, a change to resolution or maybe you can even cross it out here, I don't know, but if we came back next week, for example, just to refine it and do a final, final vote with the substitute exhibit, that's not going to mess up your November 1st schedule, I would think, well, because you just pushed it out for an additional month. Um, that part doesn't change. That part of the exhibits don't change. The exhibits, as what Mr. Dingfelder is saying, yes, they do change. Not between now and November 1st. <clears throat> if you change the exhibit um, for the customer assistance program, if what I'm hearing you say, um, then if you want it changed between now and next week, then uh, I would either have to take a recess to, you would have to make a vote, take a recess and I can change it tonight. Or if you're wanting additional time, then you would be continuing this public hearing so that I could do that and be reflected. Well, I, don't, I don't care about additional time. I just want to, if this board decided that that motion <coughs> is important, which it, I think it might be to some of those people that we talked about, fixed income people, et cetera, um, that, it, that it could be done. And maybe it could be done in a 10 minute recess, I think. But, and, and specifically, I don't mean to be, beat around the Bush Council. My motion, my, my motion is, somebody's gonna make a motion to approve this 20 year plan. Okay, it's obvious, I heard it. Uh, my motion is going to be to amend that 20 year, the program that's offered and say instead of 30% of the AMI to be 50% of the AMI because that's going to push all those numbers up a little bit so that family of two is higher, so that family of four is higher. And so we're, so, so we're really addressing some more additional people. And the reason, I, the reason I don't think that's that harmful is Dennis was very straightforward when he said, that $1.4 million out of the general fund assumes 100% participation. And, and since when is, is, does that ever happen? That means every single person who's impacted was, is gonna notice an $8 increase on their bill and they're gonna come running into the city to do something about it? No, that, that's not gonna happen. So the, my point is, is we can increase, we can increase from 30% up to 50% and still be within that 1.4 million, in my humble opinion. And before we go to Councilman Carlson, a minute, Scott, go, Mr. Rojero. Uh, thank you, Council. Again, Dennis Rojero, Interim Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Mr. Dingenfelder is uh, quite right. That is uh, potentially all uh, eligible applicants taking advantage of this program. The caveat I would submit to you is, however, as the rates go up and the revenue goes up, the cost to the general fund goes up. Again, if every single uh, applicant takes advantage of this program, it'll be about $1.4 million in fiscal year 20, $2.2 million in fiscal year 21, $3 million in fiscal year 22, and uh, I'll, I'll skip to the uh, good part. In 2032, the maximum potential impact would be $11.7 million to the general fund. So you're quite right. We don't know how many are going to take advantage of it, but the cost continues to increase significantly. Well, let me just close by asking Ms. McCleary, in, in her experience, and I know we don't have experience specifically in this program, but in, in, in your experience, you know, what, what do you think the, the percentage of folks are going to 
go through the trouble of jumping through these hoops and filling out forms and affidavits and everything else? So with the, I can point to the stormwater program, the uses have been far less than the um, total population. What's that, the percentage of, of eligible folks I think who've it's taken than, advantage of the stormwater uh, out? Less than 10%. Okay, thank you. Councilman Carlson and Councilman Maniscalco. Mr. O'Hara, <clears throat> since this is yes, being sir. funded by the general fund, isn't it a general fund issue, not a, or a budget, a regular budget issue instead of a, um, a storm uh, a w water and wastewater issue? It, it is a general fund issue, the impact of the customer assistance program. So if we wanted to, is it possible that in a given year we could um, negotiate with the mayor increasing the assistance for a short term, let's say if we go into recession or whatever, um, is it possible that we could do that out of the general fund since it's coming out of the general fund anyway, or do we have to work on the, on the, on the covenants of this first? I believe you have to work on the covenants of this first, but just for clarification, are you asking can the customer assistance program be changed? Yeah, it, <clears throat> let, let's say we put into these documents that it was 30% just as a placeholder, mm -hmm. but then um, outside of that we wanted to negotiate in next year's budget to be able to help people up to 50%. Um, would that is it possible that that could be a general fund discussion instead of, <coughs> instead of uh, changing the underlying documents for this? It could. It could. Okay. I would uh, I would add, however, and of course you heard from Ms. McCleary, uh, the uh, underrepresentation of the potential applicants that are taking advantage of the stormwater program. My only caveat to that would be the stormwater program is a much smaller increment incremental impact to the customer than this is anticipated to be. So I would, I would presume that there'd be a little more incentive for the customer to take advantage of this program because it's more of a monetary impact to them. One, one last quick thing. We, we have um, the second highest poverty rate of any major city in Florida. And I hope with all the new economic development efforts, we're going to try to alleviate that. And the recession may slow us down, but I think with all the new efforts that we're talking about collectively with staff and the mayor, hopefully we will alleviate some of that so we won't have as many people to apply because they'll be making a decent wage, too. Okay. Um, it appears that our discussion is reached a wall, I would think. Uh, just to give my thoughts, Chair always typically goes at the end many times. I don't want to talk about things that were discussed. 40 minutes ago on which there appears to be consensus, but I will say I am a strong supporter of this program. I think this is, I think a long-term solution is required because this is a long-term problem. Um, and I think regardless of the kind of economy that we're going to have in the future, if we're looking at even five years, uh, look at the way the economy was five years ago. We're in 2019, 2014. What was unemployment at? 7%? Uh, seven and a half percent, whatever it may be, it was it was significantly higher than it is today. We're always going to have uh, uh, economies go up and down no matter what, but our basic core local needs will always stay the same. And in fact, when the economy gets worse, many of them will actually uh, worsen in terms of their needs. Um, w when you take a look at our infrastructure, particularly this uh, pipes issue, this is just basic ABCs, part and parcel of what local government does. To me, this requires an approach that is fiscally sound, that actually funds the problem, which this appears to do, and that is a long-term commitment. I, I'm glad Councilman Maniscalco brought up the, uh, the stormwater issue. I thought about that in 2016, the, that vote that occurred, I think it was four to two, if I recall. And, um, and certainly that was a long-term commitment on another core government function, which is stormwater similar in some ways to what we're doing in the sense that it's a core government function. So I certainly think that this is something that should uh, go through, but I'm certainly open to talks on alleviating uh, this uh, uh, transition for, uh, uh, for, uh, for many families. So we can go from there. Anyone interested in making motions? Sure. Uh, first, do you have to close the public hearing? Yes. Move uh, close. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Manis, or by Councilman Citrus, second by Councilman Scalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And if I could just ask Ms. McLean, do you have a preference as to how, can, how can, council can an, handle this? Just to move both resolutions in one motion, or do you want to have separate? Is that is, is there what's the pleasure of of the council, or is there a need one way or the other? Um, you could you can move both resolutions at the. Okay. Thank you. As as they've been substituted both last night and this evening. Okay. Move the substitutes then. Okay. And that, that would include the exhibits C and D and all that in that wording? Yes. Okay. Well, 
May I move the uh, resolution? You may if you'd like, sir. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to move this uh, resolution with the substitutions and changes from today and, and yesterday evening. Uh, superseding all previous resolutions regarding the schedule of water rates, not including reclaimed water rates and other fees or charges for all City of Tampa water customers within the city's service area, establishing a base charge, establishing a customer assistance program, affirming and revising customer classification definitions, affirming and revising water consumption thresholds, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Escapo, a second by Councilman Citro. All in favor? And Wait, before we vote, Councilman Dinkfelder. Yeah, I think, would this be the time for amendments, Mr. Schoen? On, on this particular motion? Well, I don't know, do we have other motions that are coming, and what's the difference? There's this is, one. this is you're reading the title for the resolution of the water uh, rates. So you, you would have to also- So you're doing water, resolution. and then you're doing wastewater separately? That's what Mr. Maniscalco has indicated by his motion. I'm a fine with that. I just want to know when the amendment would be appropriate. If you intend to make this, if you t if you intend to amend, amend this resolution or some part of it, the time to do that is now. Okay. Okay. Then let's hold and let's let Mr. Dinfeld go. All right. Um, and this will apply to water and wastewater, but right now it will just apply to water because that's the that's motion, motion on that's the on floor. the floor. That's correct. The first one's an easy one. Probably can do it just as a friendly a friendly amendment that uh, requesting that staff give a, a six-month report okay. uh, for, for as long as this hike is in, uh, in place um, every six months on the progress and not only the progress of the construction and everything else but also a six-month report uh, on the MB, WMBE progress. I'll accept that. You're the second. I will accept that one, yes. Okay. Um, told you that was the easy one. Okay, the next one. Um, Hopefully, it might be uh, easy. Well, I don't know if it's easy. Anyway, um, that we adjust, and this would require Jan to go back for 10 minutes and, and, and revise the resolution, which I don't think is a big deal. We can take 10 minutes out of our evening. That we adjust the AMI, the percentage of AMI from 30% up to 50% uh, of, for the average, um, uh, the area of median income. We use the same HUD standard, but instead of 30%, we're adding some additional folks and bumping it up to 50%. I think that Ms. what Ms. McCleary said is, is very critical, that in the stormwater program, and I always appreciate your frankness and honesty, in the stormwater program, there's only 10%. So in the worst case scenario that Dennis spelled out of 1.4 million, it's, it's only 140,000 today. Um, you know, so so I think it's reasonable. I'm very very concerned about folks who are, you know, fixed income seniors, really poverty. Um, you know, I don't have those numbers in front of me anymore, but you heard them: twelve thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars. There's a lot of poverty that's above those numbers, and I don't think it hurts the program. I don't think it'll hurt the general fund, um, and I think it's appropriate under these circumstances. So I would I would uh, move to amend your motion which would, I think, need a, sep a second as well as a separate vote, unless it's accepted as friendly, well, um, to 50% of the AMI. But Councilman Carlson asked the question, if we could revisit this, you know, if, if we see that, Annually. you know, all the people are using it or taking advantage of it and we have to do it, we can revisit this next year while the rates are still within reason yes. and it increases. So we really... Well, how's that going to happen? How are we going to know? No. How are we going to know the people that are that are suffering and but they're not complaining they're just paying more okay they're paying those bills they're paying more instead of instead of bumping it up and creating more eligibility council council i, I, I do don't you know i don't see I, I never see us as being that proactive to do that mr Rivera. I, I was just say i do envision that as part of our reporting uh, structure we would include the level of participation and then of course over time you would obviously see where it started how it's increased or decreased but we could provide the level of the participation and, how, and, how did, and, and qualitatively how are you going to know what the impacts are on those families that we never hear from no, I would not know that you will not know that no. Sorry. One thing that we could include in the reports, which would help you, would be to give the number. Sorry. Um, one thing that we could include in those reports would be the number of denials for over income, along with how many inquiries we got 
um, so that you'd have those numbers. Um, so right. you wouldn't get all of what you're looking at, but, right. but you if would somebody, know. But if somebody doesn't even, they're not going to even apply, you won't know they exist if they go to the website and see that just your cutoff is 16,000 and they're above the cutoff at 17 or 18,000, you're never going to know they exist. Correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, Councilman Carlson. I'm, <clears throat> I agree with you. I think that the, the numbers are, uh, are low. 30 percent is, what is it, 14,000? 14, 14,050. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really low number, and, and it's, it's hard to survive at all at that level. But, but, but my question is, I have to ask this, what, what do you, do you know off the top of your head what the fiscal impact of, would that would be if, if we went to 50 percent? I don't know how many people that would include, and what's, do you I have do. I do. The, uh, Presuming that all eligible applicants take advantage of the customer assistance program given these uh, new criteria, the initial impact in fiscal year 20 would be $1.8 million to the general fund, escalating to over $14 million. So it's a 400, what was it before? It's like a 400,000. So about $400,000 400, increase in the increase. initial year. Is that, I know we had this discussion the other night, but is that something that, what, what did you say would be the difference by the end of 20 years? By the end of 20 years, in 2032, the impact would be $14.3 million to the general fund. Again, presuming everybody takes advantage of it, compared to what we've initially uh, surfaced for you tonight, $11.7 million. Uh, I mean, based on that, I would second that. Uh, I, um, if, I, if I may, I would just, again, remind council uh, that our rate right now is, is half of what our peer group is, and as we've discussed, won't get up to that level for another seven years. Uh, I do want to reiterate, we are also sympathetic to our customers. That's why we've increased the participation from our initial plan over 300% to what we presented to you tonight. And again, just reiterate that as uh, Councilman Maniscalco said, or reiterated, this is a flexible customer assistance plan. Yes, sir. Uh, just one final thing. So in the beginning, we're talking about 400,000 and um, over the next few years that will go up. But I just if we end up adding this, I think we all have to understand that when April comes around and and um, the staff stands up and the mayor stands up that we have to understand that we're going to give somewhere else if we're going to do this. Um, I think it's important to to help alleviate the the impact on people who can't afford this. Um, I don't I don't know what the best solution is, but this is um, this is maybe one. Um, and Mr. Shelby, for the purposes of clarity of the record, there was an initial suggestion by Councilman Dinkfelder. To the maker of the motion, there was no objection and on a friendly amendment. The first one. The first one. The first one. We're discussing was, the and, second. And, and that's true, and I want to get to that, but I want to be clear. And the seconder of the motion accepted the friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chairman, if there is no objection, I would at least, I'd like the chair to acknowledge by unanimous consent that that motion is amended before you move on to sure. the second. Motion, motion is amended as to issue A. Okay, yes. and now you have, if you want to announce, if there is a motion that's clear to the clerk and there's a second, there would be a second motion to amend that's on the floor. Yes, okay. and, and we're, we're discussing that right now. Thank you know, you. Um, Councilman Dingfelder's um, uh, uh, comments and concerns, I think, are uh, certainly not without merit, and I uh, and I sympathize with them a, a great deal. Um, especially the idea when I hear that ten about ten percent of folks uh, who can take advantage of this program with stormwater do. Those are probably um, some of the most chronic, acute cases uh, that we have in our city of 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 poverty, not just poverty in 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 in, in terms of uh, as, as a consistent, but potentially acute poverty or something is new, you have somebody lost their job, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, when folks go after this, it's because there's a real need. Um, I, I think some sort of modification is certainly something that could be warranted. I mean, just as a suggestion, we could, I mean, I hate to split the baby 40%, you know, just as a thought. But just to, you know, and, and also, I am not convinced uh, that this council will come back in a year and a year after that and, and, and adjust it because then we're going to be acutely aware on an ongoing basis of, of what the revenue loss will be. I just, I, I don't think we're going to change it after a year. I'm going to be honest. Once, once we got that money in the city coffers, we're going to be married to it and we're going to have a hard time getting a divorce. So I'm just being honest. But just my thoughts. Uh -huh. Well, you made a good point. 
Mr. Chairman, but I have to look at the overall perspective of it. When people get a water bill, they don't look at stormwater. Well, be real. They don't know what that is half the time. But they know when that blue water bill comes, they don't look at nothing else. The notices that we put in the water bill, even myself, I get my water bill, open it up, see what the bill is, I pay. All that other garbage that's behind it, people never even look at it. That's why I always say we don't market well, because if there is a crisis, something serious, no one will even know. I turned my water on just the other day at, at, at one of my rental properties. My daughter's moving in. I was going to get a drink of water out of, out of the faucet. As I went to go turn the tap on, the water comes in, I, I see this odor of chlorine. I was like, holy smoke. Hadn't been there a while. I know it's a water issue. So I'm just saying, you have to look how, we have to, we, this council has to understand, and, and, I, and our directors, administration have to understand how everyday common people live and think. I have to say, I've had that experience because I was a police officer for a long time. And I dealt with everyday common people, with everyday issues. And sometimes when we're in certain positions or we've lived a certain lifestyle, we don't understand how other people live. Fortunately, I, I, I didn't grow up poor. We didn't have everything. So I know what it is to struggle. I know what it is to make ends meet. I know what it is to have a light to turn off or have no water. Some of you in this audience may not have ever experienced that. So I live by experience when I make my decisions because I know how people live and think. And that's why I talked about the assistance program. And I'm glad that my colleague here understands that. Yes, you're asking for a bunch of money. We talk about the ratings and all this, but the everyday people, they don't give a damn about that. All they care is how I'm going to live, how I'm going to pay my bills. And we have to be cognizant of that, and we have to understand that. We represent the people. And we have to understand that, that people have needs. And I'm hoping to God that we, when we get a new economic development person, whoever the mayor gets, I hope it's somebody who understands diversity, someone who understands about poor people, somebody who understands how to come in and build communities. Because if you do that, <laughs> you won't have to worry about poverty as much. You won't have to worry about how people are living, homelessness. So we have to start thinking how everyday people think, and we got to get out of those offices and go where the people are to see how they're living and thinking, and that way we make better decisions on what we're doing. Support of the 50%. Uh, Councilman Brandon. Along the same lines as my colleague, Mr. Goods, I would imagine that 57 80% of the population don't even know you can get $5 off your solid waste bill if you're over 65. I'm so old, I got it twice. <laughs> but I don't mean it as a joke. I just, you're right. They don't look at that. <clears throat> Even if you sell it to them in red letters, they look at that, my water bill in the top. Because they become, a, you know, used to paying the water bill. The only part of the water bill I look is how many units I used. Because I know it's got to be about $40 in the whole total. If it's 45, I know I got to straighten up. But I understand what you're saying, and if, if this is predicated from what I've heard on all sides of 100% of the population using the form of 30%, I don't believe anybody, including solid waste, the population that's over 65 applies. I don't think 20% apply. Maybe I'm wrong, but even if you tell them, they got so many things in their mind. Today, society is different than when we grew up. You got the internet, you got the phone, you got everybody in the dinner table not even talking to each other. All they're looking is texting. It's different. Just in the morning, when you go to come to work or going anywhere, look how many kids are waiting for the bus school bus to pick them up, I'll give you a dollar for every time you see a kid talk to somebody else. And they're right next to each other. And everybody's got the phone texting at somebody. I don't know who. 
But that's a society that we live in. Uh, the part of the newspaper I read the most is the one ads, because it tells you what's going on. It tells you who wants to buy and who wants to sell at what price. And it, it's just the way life is. So I'm not opposed to the 50%. I would like to see it run for some period of time, see if we gauge it right or gauged it incorrectly. And if you can make a, a you know, argument that at 30% it's not viable, well, let's find out what 50% does. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. That's it, thank you. Uh, next, Councilman Dingfelder. Did you have a? Yeah, you know what they say about being in court when you, uh, you know what they say about being an attorney in court, you should know when to just shut up and, and, uh, and, and let the uh, jury make a decision. But the only thing I'd point out, with all due respect, Dennis, who does a great job, He's done such a great job that he acknowledged that they actually looked at 50%. Because when we asked him the question, he happened to have it right there on his sheet. So th this isn't an outrageous thing that we're looking at. It's something that they obviously looked at. They made their own decision, but it doesn't necessarily have to be our decision. As a, as a great attorney told me at lunch today, um, we're, the, we're the legislative body of this government, and it's our job to set policy. And uh, this is actually a very strong policy statement. So, thank you. Who was that so I can go to lunch with? Them? <laughs> <laughs> Did they I can't buy? tell you. It's attorney-client <laughs> privilege. <laughs> well, I think you have a very good verdict on your motion, or a very good jury on your motion, sir. So, just for the record, uh, do you wish to? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, for part two of that, I know we have part one with regards to the quarterly uh, updates. Councilman Maniscalco, you've had some time to consider it and ponder it, and then Councilman Citro, what is your position? I will accept the. Uh, the 50%, and I'll tell you why. Going back to the stormwater assessment, and only 10% of the people having utilized it, and considering what a big impact that is on people's property tax bills. Um, you know, I got a lot of crap for voting for it from several property owners. Understandably, you know, it's a big expense to them. But um, I, I didn't get a lot of feedback from people that. Uh, you know, saying that, you know, this is going to severely impact us, you know, low income and whatnot. So now that you're telling me that only 10% of the people have utilized that, uh, I don't think 100% of the people are going to utilize this 50%. It just gives, and I understand Councilman uh, Dingfelder's position, it gives people more of an opportunity because folks could look at the 30% now on the website or whatever and say, well, I don't qualify for it, you know. They're not going to think, well, maybe city council next year will change it <laughs> because they don't think like that. And it's true. And it's true when people open their bill, they don't read the water usage. They read how, that's how I look at my electric bill is I got to turn the uh, the air up when I'm gone during the day and turn the lights off when I'm at home and, and I do that, whatever. But um, I understand it. I'll accept it, and I don't know if the uh, councilman Citra. I will accept that uh, that motion. Okay, and I and, and I again Another state amendment, excuse me. and I again state what I said before, which is I'm supporting this because primarily because um, if if we have a legitimate concern on folks who are making uh, having a hard time making ends meet, and I promise you, we look at this again a year from now, two years from now, we very likely will not lower. Uh, that that or increase the threshold. I, I just don't think we'll do it. That's not something that legislative bodies typically do. Uh, the momentum won't be there. The pressure won't be there. The the to quote that great it song from Asia, it's won't be the heat of the moment. And right now it's the heat of the moment. So that's what it's all about. So we have a motion on the floor from Councilman Maniscalco, a second Wait. from Council. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. So I said there were three. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Go ahead. I didn't want anybody to be disappointed. But, you know. Um, my third motion is to, as I stated very early in this conversation, I agree with the need. I want to be conservative. I want to be fiscally conservative on this and truncate, grant, grant exactly what they're looking for in the, in the first, I'll even go, let's say, the first eight years, okay? Because when I looked at that chart, that was a huge big hump in the first eight years. And after that, it kind of flattens out at 100 million a year. All right. So the way I looked at it is, eight years is about two billion, and then the next 12 years appears to be about a billion or so. So, so, um, so I'd like to my third my third amendment um, 
to the maker of the motion or to the body would be to take the entire program that they've offered in terms of the rate hike and the total expenditures and everything else, but truncate it at eight years um, instead of the 20. What say you, Councilman? We, we discussed this regarding, you know, bonding I know and whatnot. I'm, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still not making changing. a motion. No, no, I understand, but, you know, bonding a certain percentage and then you having the user fee at the other percentage, you know, I know it saves you money, and Councilman Miranda explained everything, but wouldn't you get a better rate at, at 20 years than you would at, at something lower, especially when, you know, financial institutions are looking at this. They want that long-term dedicated funding source. So. I, you know, I, I would not accept it. And Councilman Citro, do you? I would not accept it either. I would not okay. accept that motion at all. That, that amendment. And, and I, and I, may I, I, I yes, sir. put that as if somebody buying a house and the bank offers you a 20 year loan and you say, no, I want an eight, and then we'll negotiate. I don't know what's going to happen after that. I like to have be consistent in my part. I am conservative, I just got a liberal heart. So, what happened to Mr. Shelby? Mr. Shelby, yes. uh, the, the maker of the motion and the second did not accept it as a, as a friendly motion, so I guess I'd like to make it as a separate amendment seeking a second, and it can, can die that. from there. We have would, a would motion. That be, would that be yes, appropriate? Can a pie. Uh, you did for the second friendly amendment the same thing to adopt it by unanimous consent. You did not get that for this third motion. So what you uh, set forth is exactly true. If it's something that you feel um, you'd like to have a motion, a formal motion to amend, you'd have to put that on the floor and get the second and then take the, a vote on that motion to amend, up or down. Yes. And that, that's what I'd like to do is um, move to um, exactly what I said, uh, which I know we're all getting tired, um, to truncate the program that's been offered at eight years instead of 20 and then the paperwork would have to be modified accordingly. Okay, we have a, a proposed motion by Councilman Dinfeld, or do we have a second? Sorry, sir, you had us at hello on the first two, but That's not sorry. the third one. So. <laughs> That's why I put them in that order. There you go. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. yes, sir, thank you. In other words, sir, it died for lack of a second. It dies for lack of a second. I heard, I heard crickets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion on the floor that uh, with, the, with the two friendly amendments by Councilman Maniscalco, and yes, sir. The question would be then, with regard to those amendments, does the exhibit then have to be altered and annexed to the resolution? Yes. Yes. And for the council to accept it, from what I understand from the deputy clerk, is then it would be a substitute to the present exhibit, is that correct? Yes. So would you then require time for that exhibit to be altered and then they come back before they motion on the resolution as substituted with the new exhibit? Yes. Thank you. How much time we do you need think We need to do that for both. We could go ahead and do that for both so I could do both exhibits at once. Yeah. And how much time do you think you would need for that? Ten minutes. Do we, do we, need, to do, do we need a recess before taking a vote? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then we go into recess for ten minutes. Wait, wait. Is that, is that okay? For, for, for both. Wait. Sorry. For, yes. Wait, so I, you need, we, start. we need to do the motion on the wastewater okay. as now, well. Um, I'll move the uh, resolution superseding any, this is the second one, superseding if, any if previous. I, if, if I can. It might be quicker just to make a motion to uh, amend the exhibit for the second resolution consistent with the direction of previous, because um, they're both basically the same, that's is that correct? With me if that's that with the you don't have to read anything, just give them that direction now, they'll come back and then you'll be able to make the motion on that when, they do the, when you, do the sub, when you oh, substitute the exhibit. Okay. Just ask them to <laughs> amend both exhibits in both resolutions consistent with council's direction. Okay, so I make a motion, I guess, to amend both exhibits uh, consistent with what you've heard up here. So when we come back, everything is all so done. Did, did we vote on the major motion? No. no. We do that afterwards. You, do, you, you cannot do that until the, until the, until the exhibit so is substituted. Okay. We have a motion by Councilman Maniscalco. And did I hear a second from second. Mr. Car Councilman Carlson? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Recess back in 10. Hey, Bear School. Hey, Bear School. No, I don't know. Bear School. Goods, Here. Maniscalco, Citro, Here. Miranda, Here. Carlson, Here. and Vieira. Here. Okay, we begin and we continue. Sorry, Jim. Um, I, uh, yes, sir. 
Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I, I do have the um, material to distribute from Ms. McLean, uh, if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I'm going to first distribute the Exhibit C. Exhibit C goes to your wastewater resolution. So I'm preparing to distribute that, and I'd like a motion when the City Council is prepared to um, substitute Exhibit C for the Substitute for the substitute. Well, but, but, and May I have that motion, please? And specifically to which document, the exhibit C? So moved. To the wastewater resolution. Thank we you. have a motion by Councilman Citra, a second by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? And now I'm setting for exhibit D, and if you could just. Exhibit, uh, it, exhibit D will be appended to your water resolution. And a motion to that effect, please. When May I have a motion, ready. please? Second. We have a motion by Councilman Goods, I believe a second by Councilman Escaco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Question? Yes, sir. I know, I'm, I guess I'm splitting hairs, Jan. When I look at Exhibit C and Exhibit D, it's titled, they're both titled Water Wastewater Customer Assistance Program. That's correct. But I thought you said one was for water and one was for wastewater. One is appended because there's only uh, A, B, and C exhibits to your wastewater resolution, and there's A, B, C, and D exhibits to your water resolution, but it's the exact same assistance program. Thank you for the clarification. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Shall we then proceed uh, with the motion? Councilman Menescalco. All right. So I uh, made the motion. It was seconded. Uh, Mr. Then we had the amendments, then we had the substitutions, and uh, now we just have to vote on it. Okay, we have a motion. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is the this is the first one. Yeah, resolution. Uh, yep, we have a, a motion on the floor for the first uh, uh, resolution by Councilman Escalco, second by Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, then we, uh, number two, sir. The, the motion carried oh, with yes. King Felder voting no. Okay. All right. Then, Wait a minute, I voted for 50, you're still voting no? I'm sorry? Was that the same resolution for 50? Yes. Yeah, that, yes. that included your amendments. I, I don't want to do a 20 year plan. I don't want to do a 20 year plan. I understand. Oh, all right. Okay, we have a resolution on the floor uh, by Councilman Maniscalco. Are there I, a second resolution? I didn't read it yet. Oh, so I have a resolution superseding any previous resolutions in conflict regarding the schedule of wastewater disposal charges for all City of Tampa wastewater customers with the city's service area. Establishing a base charge, establishing a customer assistance program, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion by Councilman Menescalco, a second by Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Sir. The motion carried with Ding Felder voting no. Okay, very good. Next, we move onward to information reports and new business by council members. Councilman uh, Ding Felder. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I apologize getting here a little late. We have a little medical stuff uh, going on in the family, but everything's fine. Um, but I, I was listening to Dennis Fernandez's report on the cigar factory, and I appreciate Council's uh, questions um, and interest in this important issue, uh, especially as related to West Tampa and our cigar factories um, elsewhere uh, in Palmetto Beach, as well as uh, uh, another one. Um, I have the memo dated September 4th uh, from, uh, let's see, through John Bennett, through Tom Snelling, from Dennis Fernandez to Council. And I think you all have it, or have had it. Um, earlier, at a previous meeting, it was recommended to us that we are, if we are concerned about the future and the protection of these cigar factories that are currently not protected, uh, and, and there's 12 of them listed on Dennis's memo, that we should refer those to the Historic Preservation Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission will then do an analysis and I think Mr. Citra you asked questions about what the analysis was and the criteria. Um, the HPC will do whatever they do in terms of evaluating uh, those 12 properties for um, some type of protection and then HPC would then make their recommendation back to us and we've talked about that process and the procedure that's been in place for many, many years, a couple of decades, I think. So uh, with that and in light of the, um, the recent events on that one factory in, uh, in West Tampa that is not protected and we saw what could happen um, and a lot of other things could happen to these valuable, valuable landmarks. 
Um, I would move that we refer to these 12 buildings, which are the first 12 listed on, Den on Dennis's memo. I could read them by address or whatever, or just uh, uh, incorporate it by reference as the first, uh, the first 12, and specifically in his memo, he says, quote, these are the 12 that are, quote, not protected by local ordinance or subject to architectural review. And the the first one is Perfecto Garcia, and the last one is Tierra del Lago. Those are the 12. I'm and, sorry. And the date of that memo? The date of the memo is September 4th. Thank you. So with that said, a, a very simple, not, it's not doing anything specifically in terms of putting any burden on them. It's just referring this to the Historic Preservation Commission for further review, um, and that's my motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion by Councilman Dingfeld or a second by Councilman Escalco. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Anything further, sir? No, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Goods? Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Escalco? Well, I believe Tuesday evening I made a motion to present a, um, a commendation to WMNF for their 40th birthday. Um, I was going to take it to the radio station, but I'd like to invite them here on September 26th. It's the workshop session. We have police officer of the month and firefighter of the quarter, and I wanted to squeeze them in. Um, Do we have any other commendations no, that day? that's it. It goes right That's fine. Okay. That's, that's it. Okay. Um, we have a motion by Councilman Escaco, a second by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Councilman Citro, anything, sir? Thank you. Just one last uh, uh, motion I'd like to make. We had a very fine PowerPoint presentation given to us tonight. I would like to make a motion that city staff make that available, whether it be in PowerPoint presentation or in paper presentation, to council members here and also be placed on the city's website. We have a motion by Councilman Citro, a second by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anything else, sir? Nothing else. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilman Moran, anything, sir? Yes, sir. One, I would like to make a motion to uh, present a combination to Dr. Emilio Chavarria, who will be presented at the Central Community. Second. The top of the 2019 annual NEMD award. I will present this award at the event of September 16th and year 20. Uh, 19. We have a motion by Councilman Miranda, second by Councilman Scott. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anything else, sir? No, sir. Councilman Carlson. Okay, nothing from me. Receive and file? So, so moved. Well, we have a motion second by second. Councilman <laughs> Goods, a second by Councilman Amanda Scott. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Councilman Jerome.